Hey guys, Daniel here. This is another video. My next guest needs no introduction. It's the legendary Brian Bolland. If you're a comic book fan, you've absolutely heard his name. He's gotten to work in countless brilliant comics. Uh, he's a legendary artist of The Killing Joke, which I have right here, which is one of probably the best comics of all time. Uh, he's gotten to work on various different other series, uh, just like Camelot 3000. Uh, he's also a famous comic book cover artist. He's gotten to do so much covers, uh, just to name a few, Animal Man, The Invisibles, you know, Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, The JLA. And yeah, you know, he's also gotten to work in 2000 AD, where he's done brilliant work on my 2000 AD shirt on. Uh, he's gotten to work on characters such as Judge Dredd and Walter the Woba. Uh, but yeah, I got some really great blackmail, so I managed to get Brian on. But Brian, thank you so much for coming on. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fine. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm not going to skip it. No problem at all. Like I said, you're one of my comic book heroes and there's so many different things to discuss. Uh, but yeah, so the first thing I want to get into is let me take you back a little bit. What's your first comic book memory? You know, how did you get into comic books? Um, my first comic book memory was being uh, bought a copy of a Dell comic in 1960 and it was called Dinosaurus. I bet you haven't got that one lined up. Uh, no. um, it, um it was um, a, a comic book version of a movie of the time. I think the guy was named the, the guy's name was Jim Damforth. He was a, a sort of um, a, a stop motion animation filmmaker, and it was a film about dinosaurs. And the, and the and I was as a kid, I was crazy about dinosaurs, <coughs> and this comic just sort of um, called out to me, and it was bought for me in 1960. So I guess that was my first encounter, and that was an American comic. I really didn't really didn't get into British comics uh, until no. a bit later. Yeah. Wow. And so then what was your first, you know, ever comic book work, you know? Um, ah, well, it's difficult to say because, you see, back in the 60s and early 70s, there were the underground magazines. There was... Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were Oz and other magazines like that. Uh, there was one called Friends, there was one called the International Times, and I had some sort of brief, scr scritchy, scratchy little comic strips in those. Uh, actually, the f I did a lot of comic strips in fanzines with uh, my friend yeah. Dave Howard back when we were in our teens. So that was, in a sense, comic book work, although it wasn't paid comic book work, it was just in fanzines. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the first comic book work, um, proper full-time comic book work, was a thing called Power Man in... Um, it, that's the one. It's on screen right now. Brilliant. Um, Who and, says I'm not professional? Don't listen to what anyone else You're says. so, so professional. If you say it has to be true, I'm just going to take the praise. <laughs> That's how it works. You know, you've gotten to do some big comics. So basically, in the words of Brian Bolland, I'm the most professional person he's ever met. He did say that. It's, it's I, I, I'll back, up, back that one up for sure, yeah. <laughs> That's a fun. But no, so Power Man was your first comic book. Uh, yes, yeah, so Dave, Dave Gibbons, you may have heard of Dave, uh, mm -hmm. and I alternated on issues of Power Man. They came out every two weeks. And they were produced here in Britain, but sold in Nigeria in 1975 oh, to 70. first hero. Uh, apparently, yes, yes, oh, I guess so. Um, and they weren't too sure that the kids there knew how to read comics. So we had to, the panels were numbered. Uh, oh, the, really? the layout had to be very simple and easy to understand. But not only that, the panels um, had numbers, little numbers in circles. So you could tell which order to read the thing in. Oh, really? So can you even look back at some of your Power Man work? Like, have you ever seen it or is it just too hard for you? You're like, no way, I can't look at this. Oh, no, I, I, I enjoy it, actually. I mean, really? the, the much younger version of me, I had nothing to fear, really. Um, yeah, because I was just starting out and I knew nobody I knew was ever going to see this stuff. So, <laughs> so it, <laughs> yeah. it has a kind of youthful enthusiasm and joy which you know because it was my first full-time pay actual paid work that um it's it's got something about it that even now that i i rather like yeah, yeah. Really? i think that now in in retirement i'm so I'm, I'm much more precious about my work and much more anx anxious not to fail back yeah. in those days we just had to ch churn this stuff out like you know i, I went without sleep to get this stuff oh, done. really and it just had to be churned out yeah Oh, amazing. And so then uh, on Power Man, you know, how did 2000 AD come about? Was that straight after Power Man or was it kind of like a gradual? Um, yeah, Power Man started in 75. But you, I'm sure you know that uh, 2008 started in yes. 77. I can't remember what month in 1977, but uh, Dave Gibbons um, left Power Man to be in the very first issue, prog of, of 2000 AD. And I just carried on with Power Man for another half a dozen issues or so. 
Um, how, how did it come? Well, you see, but our agent um, was called Barden Press Beach, was run by a chap called Barry Coker, and he had links with IPC. He, he supplied oh. a lot of the artists who were Italian or Spanish. Uh, the name Barden Press Beach is, is, a, is a conflation of Barcelona and London oh, because yeah. he had a lot of um, Spanish artists available to work in British comics. So he was given first dibs, really, at providing um, art artists for the new 2000 AD. Yeah, brilliant. And so you got to do some brilliant work on 2000 AD. This here, is this your first cover or just first general work? You've gotten it to is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. and so you know since then obviously you've gotten to do a lot more covers but your judge dread just the way you draw him is one, is one of my favorite it's probably my favorite dread because he's just he, you just have a great understanding of the character and so this is like we said we asked the hard hitting questions here how hard is it to draw, how hard is it to draw judge dread's helmet you know that's some, that's some <laughs> popular I, well so I'll, many I'll... artists say it's impossible because it just proportionally so what's it like for you getting to draw his helmet uh... Well, I mean, now I've had a long gap, you know, since I last drew him. Uh, I, I realise I've kind of forgotten, but <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to Mick McMahon, who was a new artist to to, well, to most people, I think, at the time. And uh, um, Carlos created Judge Dredd. Carlos, the artist, yeah. created Judge Dredd. But in my view, um, Mick McMahon developed him. And week by week, his... Um, work changed and sort of improved and gradually the helmet and the whole appearance of Judge Dredd changed uh, and I was trying to sort of keep up with that change um, and I still think that there is a, an absolute way of doing it that not everyone gets somehow yeah. um, but it's quite hard but I mean occasionally when I used to do sketching at, uh, at conventions and things which I don't really do anymore um, it would. I, I'd always well, literally dread being asked to draw dread because he takes forever to draw. You know, you can draw. Oh some yeah, of the, uh, he must. Oh yeah, I mean all that stuff all over him. You know, the 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 pterodac pterodactyl on his shoulder, for instance, and and everything else. You know, you just spend a long time filling in all the details. Do you ever just um, like do a silhouette and say it's dread in the shadow? Just take it. That, <laughs> well, that's, occasionally. <laughs> that's what occasionally. I do. Occasionally, I was asked to draw a judge dread without a helmet. Oh, um, actually, that must have been so good for you. You could have just drawn anyone. Just, oh no, <laughs> it's dread. I know. <laughs> John, Wagner. what you do? What you do is you draw the bit of his face up to where the helmet would have been, and then you just don't draw anything else. Which <laughs> oh, <is literally>, that's, <laughs> that's brilliant. Which is, which is literally what they asked for, isn't it? Yeah, you just get away with that saying, no, no, he's in the shadow. You, you, you wouldn't. Un <laughs> I'm an artist. I understand how this works. It's my artistic interpretation of Judge Dredd standing in the shadow. And that's why, that's why if, if I was ever an artist, I'd just silhouette everything and try and get away with it. But Judge Death is another character <laughs> right here. who is like, and I have, of course, his original appearance here. Oh, very good. Very one good. Of my, one of my prized possessions. But did you get to design this character or was um, it? Uh, well, I've been trying to think of that actually because. Oh, really? I, I well, I. I did. I mean, it was definitely me, but I'm, I can't actually remember what I was told he would look like. Oh, uh, oh Tom, have you interviewed John Wagner? No, no, unfortunately uh, not. Because I would, I'd, I'd love to be reminded what he said to me when he came up with Judge Death and what he told me he should look like. I don't remember how he sprang into existence. I remember when we did the other dark judges, how many of them were, were there in total? Four, I guess, weren't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, there would be four, yeah. Um, there was, a, I did do quite a few drawings of alternative versions of um, the other judges. Oh, yeah? Um, as for Mortis, I've still got on the shelf over there, I've still got the, uh, the sheep skull that I found in Cumbria, which became his head. Oh, nice. And yeah. yeah What's it like getting to draw the character, Judge Dredd? Because he's kind of this, like, weird, scaly, you know, figure. And I mean, I guess maybe scaly is not right, but as opposed to Judge Dredd, do you think there's much of a difference between those two characters, just proportion-wise? Um, well, Mortis is partly not there. I mean, I'm looking at him right now on your screen. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I see that bits of his body are just no longer there. Um, you should have uh, just silhouetted it, like I told you. It's well, so I could have done. I, I, I could do the whole thing in silhouettes, couldn't I? That would save yeah. a lot. Of time. That's your artistic interpretation of the whole thing being silhouetted. Uh, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. And some more brilliant. Didn't you get to return? I don't know, because the, these two covers on the end, they're kind of more recently enough. Am I correct in saying so? 
Well, the one top right, I'm assuming your customers will be seeing the same picture that I am, but the one top yeah. right hasn't actually come out yet. Oh, think, it hasn't. No, I mean, it was, um, usually I don't show these things until they are first published on the cover of the magazine, but somebody published this online, even though it's not actually out on a, on a 2000 AD yet. But could, I mean, it's to mark the 45th anniversary. I think this is a 45th anniversary issue. Nice. But um, Matt Smith, who is Tharg, there's a secret given away there. Um, what? He's Tharg? No, <laughs> I didn't see this coming. Uh, uh, did, um, did you not? Um, it's like the he, worst he, secret identity to have. I'm uh, who could be Tharg in 2080 offices? It could be <laughs> anyone. Ah, oh. and then the editor's I, sitting there like, you know. I think Matt has been Tharg for longer than anybody else. He's been there for 20 years now. Longer than Stevie Mac? I think so, yes. Oh, wow. That's not we'll happening. You'll have to ask them. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. I have to get Matt to on soon. But yeah, absolutely. And so yeah. let me ask, this is, like we said, hard-hitting journalism. I asked this of all my 2080 guests. If you could see two 2080 characters fight, who would it be and why? <laughs> um, I've got to admit to a certain degree of ignorance um, because I haven't read much of 2080 for quite a long time. So I, I don't even know who some of the characters are, to be quite honest. I'll answer uh, this one for you. Walter the Woba and oh, yeah. uh, Strontium Dog, obviously. Okay, okay. That has to be arranged, doesn't it? Honestly, I just have Walter the Woba against anyone. That's what you I are. always say. Like, I'll just come up with a new character for Walter the Woba to go against because he, he's obviously going to win every fight. So it's not really much of a fight. Oh, he's great, isn't he? Yeah, oh, what a great character. And so I just brought up there Walter the Wobot. You got to do some brilliant work on Walter. Such a great oh, character. We also like getting to draw him. Um, <laughs> well, it, it took a while um, I, to realise um, how seriously people would be taking Judge Dredd, you know, how Dredd yeah. would become the, really the most iconic character in the, in the comic. Um, and so... I don't think I was taking it all that seriously. So when I was asked to draw Walter, because I do love doing funny stuff, because, I mean, Judge Dredd does contain... Um, humour. Kind of ridiculous humour, doesn't it? As well as a kind of dark, cutting satire. Um, and so it wasn't a great stretch to, to draw something as blatantly slapstick funny as Walter. In fact, um, I don't know whether you know... Um, Don Mart the the work of Don Martin. Uh, he was a mad cartoonist. You know, have you heard of him? Oh, I've heard of Mad. You know, cartoon. But I'm yeah. afraid I haven't heard of. Uh... Ah, well, there was a cartoonist in Mad magazine called Don Martin who um, always drew char <clears throat> characters of a certain with a certain look. And if you look at the one, two, three, fourth panel along, that weird looking little man to the right of of of, of Walter is a is a blatant swipe of Don Martin's Festa Besta Tester. <laughs> oh wow so that there was you know I, I didn't even ask i just made the character look like this festa besta tester who is a don martin cartoon character brilliant it always amazes me how artists can draw like robots or like buildings there's obviously so much detail goes into it i think walter's just such a brilliant character would you say walter's your favorite 2000 ad character if you had to choose one <laughs> well it seems to be yours Oh, uh, how well, am I that obvious? I tried to hide it, but you know, sometimes <laughs> it just slips out. But yeah, um, I'm trying to get the around? Walter scoop. I'm trying to get. The scoop. <laughs> is he around much these days? I haven't. I've got. I, I got the latest issue today. Yeah, I don't think I, there's any currently running. Pro no, no, no. no. He he may pop up occasionally. I don't think anybody gets completely finished off. But uh, yeah, he's a great character. Um, I mean, I'm sure I have. I mean, to be quite honest, my favourite. Um, 2080, even Judge Dredd characters were drawn by people other than me. Oh, um, really? That's yeah, it. I mean, I, I love the League of Fatties, um, and I love, <laughs> yeah. and I did, I have managed to um, draw a few uh, individual one off League of Fatties. I did a League of Fatties cover for 2080, which I don't think they ever used. Oh, nice. Yeah. Absolutely. So here's my plan. Let me cut you in on this. So I'm going to, yeah, go I have, I have a few like on writers who are currently working on 2080 right now that I have arranged okay. for interviews. So here's yep. what we do. I'm going to bring up Walter the Woba subliminally, and then we're going to, we're going to get a new prog with Walter the Woba. <laughs> Between me and you, obviously, but this is, it can't go wrong. I've thought about it's airtight. It's going to go perfectly, but yeah. So okay. I'll, 
I'll get it going. But yeah, and so don't you have a convention, a 2000 AD convention appearance? Yes, yes, yes. Coming up. There is one on, something like the 26th, 25th, 26th of May of this year. I'm in Bristol. Yeah, every, everyone, there'll be a link for that in the description. I remember I saw yeah, that. Like, a, a, and I'm going partly because a lot of my old pals are going, like Mick McMahon's going, Glenn Fabry, um, John Higgins, who I haven't seen for ages, and quite a few others. And it, it'll be nice to, to hook up with them again. I, I'm not quite sure how having a comic convention in face masks is going to, how much fun that's going to be. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure comic two whole like, days. creators just love getting their faces covered up, you know. It must, right? <laughs> Where's your dread helmet? That would, well, I mean, that, 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 yeah, that doesn't work, though, that's does it? like the <laughs> antithesis of protecting yourself from COVID. It only shows the places where you can catch it. But you, know. you catch COVID in style, which is, I mean, <laughs> when you think about it, well, I mean, no, it's not, not such a great trade off. But, you know, if I was going to catch COVID, no, I know. I'd prefer to be dressed as Judge Dredd. But yeah, we'll get Walter. What if we get a life size Walter the Wobot? I'm sorry. I, 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 you can't I get off this Walter the Robot thing, can you? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm only realizing now I'm dedicating this whole interview to Walter the Wobot, which is when I'm joined by, you know, it maybe shouldn't be. Actually, no, maybe it works for this interview. But yeah, Walter the Wobot is, in case anyone didn't know, it's such a great character. Stop, Stop talking about it. <laughs> No, he's brilliant. <laughs> I never thought it's a very great start to I the think, I, Hold it, hold it. I think my, one of my favorite characters was Judge Fish. Judge Fish, yeah. Oh, I can't believe I didn't put that cover in. I was meant to put it in. Yeah. Really, I love I've got it. a I've got a somebody sent a little model, Judge Fish. I don't know, I don't know how well your customers can see this, but it, he came in a little how can you have the nerve to say Walter the Walbert and then say your favorite character is Judge Fish? <laughs> oh, he's brilliant. There's, there's the, the, the goldfish bowl. And there's Judge Fish. And I think he, he sort of fell out. Judge Fish is such a weird character. I can't believe... I, I, didn't you get to do a cover with Judge Fish on it? Yeah, the, yes. I mean, for the American market, um, Eagle Comics, I mean, which you can see the, the cover of number one there, um, um, repackaged... Um, uh, um, the already existing Judge Dredd stories and put them in colour. And we did do a, a, a Judge Fish cover, which was one of my favourites. Yeah. Judge which Fish I, I kept the artwork for a long time, but eventually I sold it. Yeah. For... Judge Judge Fish versus Walter. That's your answer. We get to see the boat at M fight. That's a clash. We don't know who will win. But yeah, Walter, what a great character. And the fish, you know. Yeah. But, but I do like the I do like the Cleggs as well. Yeah, more great characters. Yeah. 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 And Caligula of loads of oh, yeah. Yeah, Loads of them. Definitely. And so these this was a character we just touched on a minute ago, but these are four dark judges. So this were these people that you got to design as well? You just brought up these were all designed by you. Um I am just gonna go sure. away from the camera for one second. We'll be grabbing something cool. This is probably very unprofessional. That's no problem at all. That is Mortis. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I mean, that is just a, a, a just a sheep skull, which anybody can probably find on a field in a field somewhere. But uh, <laughs> uh, I did. Yeah, I designed all those characters um, and I did send a few alternative versions to Don Wagner. For, I think it was John Wagner to for him to choose. And we came up with eventually came up with those four. And I couldn't quite make up my mind what should be inside Fear's helmet. Oh, I think, really? Did you struggle with that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Nice. It goes into the face, what is it? Gaze into the face of fear. And then, of course, Dread says, gaze into the fist of dread. Yeah, brilliant. And that, like, yeah. I can't, you're so, I can't believe you were so committed that you genuinely cut open a dead sheep just to take its skull. That's <laughs> a brilliant commitment from an art. I wish everyone would. Yeah, like it was a live and happy sheep until, until I came along. <laughs> Brian's just in the bush like that, waiting for his moment. With a little pocket knife. There you go. That's a lovely insight. So far, in what, less than 20 minutes in, we've talked about, you know, dead sheep, uh, fish, and robots. So, yeah. We haven't, we, haven't, we haven't touched on Walter the Robot yet, have we? Oh, you're right. Oh, I can't believe uh, we, we need to cut. <laughs> <laughs> did you know that I actually love Walter the Robot? Have I, I, didn't, I did not know that. No, I'm very forgetful. I have the memory of a, of a fish, you could say. It's like Judge Fish, uh. yeah. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. These four dark judges were brilliant. Recently, a judge dead. Have you seen this? There was an action figure uh, announced. Have you seen that they're going to be of making, what? Sorry, of what? Judge, judge Death. They're going to be making a six-inch action figure. Have you seen <clears> this? Um, no, um, well, I mean, I've got a few. Actually, I mean, I've got a sort of 
18, can you talk in inches, an 18 inch high? Yeah, there are the inches, there. yeah. There are big ones, there are all sorts of uh, figures, figurines of all the characters now, aren't there? But, but there's going to be a new one, is there? Yeah, exactly, and it's going to be six inches. I assume you'll, you'll get a comps, but yeah, you know, we have yet to get, you know, a fish one, which actually, no, you just had one there, yeah, that's brilliant. If only yeah, there was... was if only we could make a figure out of some robot. Uh, I guess we'll yeah. never know. I and guess we'll never know. Who? What? Well, uh, yeah, all right. Who, 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 you know, keep it on topic. We don't know who he is. You know, please don't bring up these obscure characters. Walter the what? <laughs> all right, yeah, we'll move on. But yeah, absolutely. We have to touch on this. The most iconic 2080 panel of all time. Do you, oh, yeah. how many people get this, get this signed at conventions? Do you get this a lot, this image? Um... <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I, I do get it. Um, uh, people seem to make sort of special zikli or something prints uh, of this because it's kind. Of, it is kind of iconic, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, I think it's one of. And, um, and they make a sort of an edition of fifty or so, and 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 I sign them. Um, but yeah, I, I see it quite often. Yeah, I'm very you know, very pleased with it. I, I like it quite a bit. Yeah. Are you surprised that this panel was as big as it is? Like, how many people just love it? Um. <clears throat> Well, I suppose I am. I'm surprised by just how Judge Dredd and how too, how long long lasting 2000 AD has been, and how popular Judge Dredd. I mean, in some ways, I think Judge Dredd seems to be one of Britain's most enduring comic book characters. I mean, we've had Dan Dare, and we've had the guy who eats cow pie. What was his name? What was his name? Do you know what I'm talking about? The guy who eats copper. No cow pie. From oh. the Beano or the Dandy. Oh, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dennis the Menace? Uh, it wasn't Dennis the Menace. Um, I, I, uh, then I'm sure. Could it be someone called Walter? Because that's the only real. No, thing. it's not. His name wasn't Walter. No, no. I, we'll, we'll have friends of mine who are shouting at me right now because I can't remember the guy who ate cow pie. He'd eat, a, he'd eat a, an entire cow sandwiched in a bun with the horns. <laughs> he was a big, a big sort of barrel chested comic book character. And that's um, why I love British comics because you know they just eat you know like giant cows and like some of the artists just go around like you know eat like you know ripping the skulls out of sheep. So no, yeah, no, uh, no, I'd never do that. No, I'd no, never. no, no. It was you, you know, it, you just found it like that. Is that what we should we should say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was coincidence. You just yeah, okay. We'll, we'll let it slide. But yeah, absolutely. So you know, this panel I think is so brilliant. And like, like say, so you're kind of obviously still amazed that people still talk about this and still talk. It's just probably. You know the, your your favorite panel you've ever done? Would you say or? Oh no, um, probably not my favorite. I mean, I, <clears throat> it's almost impossible to say what your favorite anything is because you know your favorite is something different on on any given day. And uh, you know, I've, I've done a whole lot of things that I've uh, maybe maybe people haven't really seen so much that I, I really liked. But you know, this one's popular. I like it. I mean, the cover of. The Killing Joke's very iconic as well, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. I'll be honest, I did look around my house for a Polaroid just so I could make a silly practical joke, but the only one I found was my sister's little pink camera, and I was like, maybe ah. maybe if we whip that out in the interview, maybe, I don't know if that'll work, but yeah, <laughs> there you go. I don't know if me pulling out a pink Polaroid camera would gain, you know, respect from you, or maybe do the exact opposite, because between talking about Walter and whipping out a pink Polaroid, it's like, am I kind of, you know, to find the odds right now? But yeah, absolutely. Before we move on from 2080, everyone, I'd like to take a minute at the shout out uh, this shirt. It's Carlos Esquire Memorial shirt. I got this from my good friend Paul Trimble, who runs the Enniskinen and Oman Comic Fest. Everyone should go check it out. I'd highly recommend you do so. Uh, but yeah, everyone go check that out on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but yeah, definitely. I, I can't see the t-shirt. Do you want to just stand up so we can see the whole image? Yeah, yeah go a little bit a little bit higher. What's on there? It's a what is that? Oh, that's better. That, that's Carlos, isn't it? Yeah. Is that Carlos? Yeah, and it says Ennis Gillen on the back. Oh, fantastic. And who was the artist on that? Uh, I'm know? actually not aware. I'll see. I'll try. I'll see if I can find that. And if I do mm. find out, there'll be a, a link for them in the description. For yeah, them. okay. Put a link. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Absolutely. So coming off 2080, let's just touch on DC. How did this come about to you? You know, were you allowed? Did you build up yourself a name in Britain before you were contacted by DC or? Um, well, I, I, I could have gone. When you asked me what my first experience of comics after this one particular Dell comic with the dinosaurs on, I moved into collecting DC comics. Uh, this was 1961, um, and I became a massive collector, a fan of DC comics, and 
it pretty much had a complete collection of just about everything from the late 50s onwards you know i had a complete set of green lantern flash yeah. atom all of those dc comics i had a few marvels I've, I've got to mention this but marvel came along a couple of years later oh yeah, yeah. and i only dabbled a bit with marvel um uh, so I was a big fan of um, Gil Kane on Green Lantern and the Atom. Um, now, this, I'll, I'll make this story brief. Um, Joe, no, go ahead, yeah. Artist, American artist Joe Staten was drawing uh, Green Lantern. He came, he needed a table to work on. Uh, he came and borrowed our spare table in our flat. And he phoned up his editor at Green Lantern at DC. And said, so there's a guy here who'd really like to draw a Green Lantern cover. Oh, um, really? But, That's how you got it? And, and the, uh, the editor was Jack C. Harris, so I've got every, um, on every occasion, I, I need to thank Joe and uh, Jack C. Harris uh, for letting me do the, the one in the middle. And, and that was your uh, first ever DC work, would it be correct? It was, yeah, that was the very first. I, I mean, I had drawn DC characters in fanzines. Oh, oh, have, uh, oh did you? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, there are so many um, very amateurish um I mean, even when I was about 13, I used to recreate um, the covers of, uh, I don't have that. I should have prepared myself a little bit more by having a few more bits of art, a few bits of artwork and samples here. But I used to do recreations of DC covers of Green Lantern and Justice League in crayon, you know, in ballpoint pen and crayon when I was a very early teenager, so... Uh, so do you still use crayon in your work? No. Pen or, <laughs> I, or you... I do not, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it adds texture anyway. But yeah, so this middle cover was the first cover you ever did. So do you remember, like, feeling kind of nervous because this is your first DC work? I felt very excited. I just oh, couldn't really? believe. I mean, I remember at school, uh, I'm sure I was asked to write a composition, which is now an essay, um, where I, what would be the most fantastic thing I would love to do and, and one it would be to meet Gil Kane who was the artist who was my hero and B was would be to draw a DC comic. And, when did uh, you get to meet Gil Kane? Oh yeah a few times yes. Oh, you know wow. who, yeah. And who says dreams don't come true? Sorry? Who says dreams don't come true? Well absolutely yeah so, so I I mean back in 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 the you know when you're young you you're fearless really and I, I, I was primarily excited and couldn't believe what I was uh, being asked to do. So I just did a few Green Lantern covers to begin with and then some short stories for oh, various absolutely. issues. Absolutely. And so something I love, I recently had on, well, recently enough, Jerry Conway. And I know we talked about oh. Starro. And so this cover yeah. really, this, the, it, the story behind Starro seems really interesting to me. But can you tell us about this cover and, you know, how this all came about? Yes. <clears throat> Um, on one of my visits to the DC offices, probably 1979, I guess, because I think these two issues came out in 1980, um, before getting there, I, 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 I'd met Julie Schwartz, who was the sort of um, legendary uh, DC Comics editor um, of things like Strange Adventures and Mystery in Space and Justice League, and he suggested I just come up with a, a, a cover just on spec to, to take with me to, to DC. And I think the film Alien had just come out. And of course, if you know Alien, you know the yeah. face of Alien. And I thought, well, now, Starro was on the cover of the very first Justice League um, comic, which was in Brave and the Bold, number 28 in 1960. Um, and I don't think Starro had been used as a villain. I think they thought he was just so ridiculous. that, that How could you possibly use him? And, but it was, of course, it was nostalgic for me because it it, it went all the way back to the beginning. And uh, yeah. so I drew that and Julie liked it. And <clears throat> he um, asked me to do a, the second a second one, which would actually come out on the previous issue. And he would get a writer. I don't know quite who the writer was. Was it Jerry Conway? It was Jerry Conway, yeah. Uh, who, who was actually asked to draw to, to, to write the story after I'd drawn the cover. Yeah, so you had a hand in that, and I, I believe, have you seen the recent Suicide Squad film? I have, yes. Nice. <laughs> I was absolutely delighted that uh, Starro was in it. And, yeah, actually, uh, and were you tanked in the credits? I was, yes, but then so were about 50 other people. Yeah, but not half bad getting your name there, but yes. That no, was. it's great. I mean, you've got to sit there until the cinema's completely empty. 
to see your own name. But in fact, I, to be quite honest, I didn't see it. But oh, yeah. uh, some, somebody on Facebook, I think, um, said, oh, your name was up there and, uh, and, and sent me a link. And I noticed that John Wagner's on there and loads of other people that uh, yeah, I know. They've all from. added to the Suicide Squad. Yeah, but yeah I, well, I, did, I did sort of think, you know, that Starro may not have been in the film unless I had sort of brought him back on this one occasion in 1980 i don't know maybe I'm absolutely wrong. no i'd say you're correct like he he wasn't used up till this point i think you know there's obviously so much elements of starro just in these two images there that have just yeah. been oh, yeah. into that character but yeah. yeah i never thought we'd see starro in a film does this mean we're gonna get <laughs> well, walter, I think, walter I think the whole premise of suicide squad was to, <clears throat> to to rediscover some of the most ridiculous disposable characters in uh, uh, dc comics like um the disc, what was he, the guy who could throw discs or something? Polka Dot Man? Polka Dot Man? Yeah, Polka Dot Man, that's the one, yes. Now, he was in, probably in a in a detective or Batman comic in the very early 60s, uh, yes. w when the stories were just ridiculous. And uh, so so in that film, they came up with a, a lot of... I, I've always rather loved um, bringing back the ridiculous characters. I think Grant Morrison's modus yeah. operandi at one point when he was doing Animal Man was to the psycho pirate. He'd come up with all these characters that had just faded into oblivion. The more ridiculous, the better. And I right. just sort of re-examined them. And I, I always rather like that. Yeah, and I love this, uh, you know, the Starro image of my right, uh, you know, where, where all their faces are covered in stars and big star in the background. It's one of my favourite yeah. comic book covers of all time. It's the thumbnail from my Jerry Conway uh, video. But that, it's such a good cover. And I love it. I love those two images. But yeah, we can thank oh, you for you. Starro. It's, it's just so... <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's a, a legacy that you, you know, added to a big, you know, purple... What could you even call him? I don't even have the words to describe him. But yeah, there you go. Is it starfish? Is it? Is is oh, that yeah, a... starfish. That's a word. Yeah, big purple, weird looking starfish who will control you. And is he an echinoderm or something like that? I don't know quite what he is. We can't, he's too, he's too beautiful. We can't comprehend him. That's probably the way. But we somebody can. said, why has he got a, <clears throat> a Captain America shield in the middle of him? And, uh, and I think the film did actually improve on him by giving him an a, a movable eye in the middle there. Yeah. Which a real starfish doesn't have. I think, that, well, I mean, I don't think we have to look for realism in our comic books. No, we do not. We do not, no. Yeah, if, if a big purple starfish came down, I'd immediately be like, awesome. And then uh, this is how I knew I'd die. I knew a big purple I starfish. wouldn't be asking any questions at all. <laughs> well, I just begin <laughs> praising our overlord starfish from then. Like, I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not biting it. Not today, right? It's not going to be a purple <laughs> starfish that takes me. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. So another thing you've got to do for DC was Camelot 3000. Was this yes. the first, you know, like just the first ongoing series you've ever done, not counting Power Man? Well, yes. I mean, not, not counting. I mean, Power Man was about 380 pages. And, and I think uh, um, Camelot 3000 was probably approaching, what did I just say, 280? Uh, and I think Camelot was approaching 300 pages yeah. in total. Uh, so it was my next um, big job. And, and it was, I, I had to throw in my, you know, uh, what is the term? I had to say to 2008, oh, I, I can't do any more for you because I've got this full time um, do job for DC. And it was, you know, it's great to be, I mean, you need to be fully employed, you know, as an yeah. artist. You're, it's very, you're very fortunate if you can. I mean, what the great thing about being a comic book artist is that work is regular. You know, I think in, as a, I wouldn't recommend being an artist to any young up and coming person because it's such, um, um, precarious work, you know, really. But Definitely. with comics, at least if you're on a reg if you're on a continuous series, you you do have work for two years, which is which is good. Yeah, definitely. And so, yeah. like, Camelot was this kind of the first? I don't know if you say big thing because this was your first work for DC that wasn't just covers. Was was it? Yeah. Or, yeah. And, <clears throat> well, it was the first big job. I mean, I did do some short stories in Mystery in Space and. There was one other, Madame Xanadu, I think it was in, I, uh, like a six or an eight pager. There was one called Falling Down to Heaven or something like that. And that was just a, a, an interior story. But this was, I've forgotten the, precisely what your question was, but this was a, um, a lengthy thing. And it was um, part of this new idea they were having of direct sales, you know, that they were doing away with selling comics on newsstands. and. Um, 
so selling them directly to the, this growing um, population of, of comic shops, wasn't it? That, that and a few other things. There was a, um, Marvel had a thing called Dazzler, which I think uh, was also direct sales. And it was done on um, prestige paper, as they call it. So it was not on that sort of uh, brown newsprint paper that comics used to be on. And so you were working with Len Wein. Was he the editor on this? Len was the editor. And I got to know Len really well. He came, <clears throat> I mean, Len, I mean, in 79, when I met Joe Staten and got that first Green Lantern cover, Len and Joe Staten had come to Britain for a, <coughs> excuse me, for a, a comic convention. So I met Len at the time. So I knew him already. Oh, nice. Excuse me. No, it's okay. Don't worry. Uh, but yeah, Camelot 3000, it's such a great series. But so were you inking yourself on this? Because a lot of this just seems to be pencils. Were you inked by someone else? No, I wasn't. Um, <clears throat> and it was a bit of a wrench for me because um, all, all up till now, um, all the work I'd done in Britain was not subdivided into pencil and inker. I did the whole thing. Occasionally I would ink um, Dave Gibbons' is Dan Dare. And, and there were a couple of times when I was in a bit of a crisis and Dave um, inked <coughs> some of my uh, Power Man pages because I'd fallen behind. But in the case of Camelot, it was 20, was it 25 pages per issue? And oh, I, I met Len a few times and he would be, he, he, when I was first drawing Camelot, I had to do a lot, a lot of research. And Len and Mike Barr, who was the writer, and I went, <coughs> went out to Stonehenge and places like that together and so we spent quite a bit of time together but yeah he was the editor on Camelot. Nice brilliant and so yeah Camelot I think is one of, you, one of my favourite series you've gotten to work on but now let us touch on The Killing Joke which is a, one, one of the greatest. Do you, do you like how I did the fonts? I'm very proud of that. I think it, I'm just like like I said I'm just the most professional person I know and the most <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the killing joke, I have it right here. Is it true? I don't know if it's true, but did you go to Alan with the concept? I did, yes. Nice. I did. Tell well, um, the, um, all the 2000 AD people, Dave Gibbons, Kevin O'Neill, uh, and I, and Mick McMahon. Yeah, absolutely. And so is it true that you went to Alan Moore with uh, the killing joke? Or how did this even come about to you? Did you go and pitch it to him? Um, well, after Camelot, um, I had a bit of a break uh, and I came back from a trip abroad um, and I said to um, um, Dick Giordano at DC Comics, uh, what would you like me to do next? And he said, well, you can do anything you like, Brian, um, which was a great opportunity. And I thought, well, I'd love to do a Batman graphic novel. I'd, I'd love my pal, um, Alan Moore, to, to write it because we were good pals, you know, all of us, at, to uh, all of the X 2000 AD uh, people were, were good pals, we all knew each other. Um, previously, Alan and I had been um, Mike Lake at Titan Books um, had had the idea of getting uh, a Batman and Judge Dredd graphic novel together with DC and Fleetway. And Alan had actually written a synopsis for a potential story of those two characters in a story together. Oh, yeah? And I was going to be the artist. But because of disagreements between the two companies, it didn't happen. Uh, so Alan and I were somehow always destined to do something together. And when this opportunity came along, I, um, Alan was asked, um, and he asked me what I would like to, to be in the story. And I said to Alan, well, I really would like it to be more a Joker story than a Batman story. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so he went ahead and did what he did on The Kelly Joke. So in a sense, uh, it was my, it was on my instigation. Yeah. So that answers your question, doesn't it? Yeah. Did you tell him how much you love drawing robots? Did that come up at all or did you just skip No, it? no, no. We, I, I forgot to ask him to include. A <laughs> I think that's my biggest criticism with The Killing Joke. There's no robots the or fishes. So. No, that's true. There was no Walter the Wobot in The Killing Joke. I, I don't know. It would have been much better with him, wouldn't it? Yeah. Listen, yeah. that's why, for some reason, DC, I'm responding to any of my emails about, I have like a 800-page script on a completely original character called Roger oh, the Robot. Created oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, Ro that... Yeah. Maybe that would make a great sequel. 
it's something that's never been done before in the history of comics. Roger the Robot. That's I think true. That is true. Yeah, I was traveling the world and I was, you know, getting it. I was opening my third mind's eye and I was like, he's the character comic books need. But yeah, I'll let you draw some of the series because I'm very generous, you know. Uh, yeah, okay. absolutely. A joke. And so let me talk about this iconic cover. Because I mean, when you think of the Joker, many people think of this. And here we have, is this actual photo reference you used? Yeah, that's that, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Using the Polaroid camera. <laughs> Um, no, well, did you say Polaroid camera? No, that that is a. I can't remember the brand of camera that was. I mean, you. It's uh, it's not a Polaroid, is it? It's it's a it's a SLR single lens reflex camera of some description. And of course, I had to reverse my fingers on there. I had to give the impression that I was using my right hand to press yeah. the, the shutter, whereas in fact I was actually using my thumb. To press the shutter because it's of course being a mirror it's uh it's in reverse isn't it so uh, so there you go absolutely and so did this cover come about did alan ask you to draw this specific image on the um, or well the thing is the killing i mean the, the way alan wrote the killing joke was incredibly precise he's very visual with yeah. his writing um instructions you know uh, that nine panel grid that came up with with watchmen was we stuck to it fairly rigidly we didn't we broke from it a few times yeah. uh, but when it came to the cover i'm really racking my brains to try to think where the idea came from the idea seemed to somehow be without question the cover that had to be on the book um yeah you know i mean that was the sort of key moment if anything the most awful moment in the story um and it just came to me and, I, and I, uh, one day i may come across an image somewhere that i saw which gave me the idea but I, it, it 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 came to me without any input from len ween or alan as far as i can tell um yeah. so there you are they're, they're, yeah that's, that's a, uh, yeah that's definitely and that's a really interesting point you just brought up there from working from alan's scripts and like you know if you, yeah. you see the interviews with people like dave gibbons you know he says yeah. he said in some of his interviews that he, he met up with uh you know alan and they discussed it beforehand did you meet up with alan before or did he just no 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 i mean i was a great admirer of alan's writing on 2000 ad you know i loved his um yeah well things like the bo jeffrey saga in warrior and um the things he'd <laughs> written um dr and quinch i love the things he'd yeah. written in 2000 AD. um uh, and when he agreed to do the story um i you know i said i think it ought to be a joker graphic novel more than batman um he just went away and wrote it and only on one occasion during the writing did he ring me up um i think he was going through a difficult patch with it and he rang me up i'm not entirely sure why but he talked me through the problems he was having with it and then he said oh, well and then he just carried on and finished the thing <laughs> yeah um, so i didn't really um when I was doing Camelot, I had quite a bit of input in, into the story with Mike Barr. Yeah. But with, with The Killing Joke, it was entirely Alan. I, I personally would not have chosen a lot of the things in the story to draw. Um, but I left it entirely up to him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, you just put that perfectly there. But, you know, a really good YouTuber called Own Likes Comics, everyone should go check him out. But he made a video breaking down a killing joke and discussing why he thinks it's such a masterpiece. But one of the things he mentions is, you know, he could see some inspiration. I think he just brought up the 1928 film, The Man Who Laughs. And he said, some, yeah. were you at all inspired by that film? Um, I was, yes. Um, yeah. I went to the National Film Theatre in London to see The Man Who Laughs. Um, but I don't remember whether it was after I'd already drawn this or before. It, it was not a film I knew, well, obviously, until I'd seen it. But um, to me, I, I think I must have seen an image from The Man Who Laughs, 1927, 1928, yes. silent movie, um, which they say Jerry Robinson used as his inspiration for creating The Joker. Uh, and I still think that the... The, the depiction of that face is the best of all the Joker faces we've had so far. Now, I don't know whether there are copyright issues here. I don't know who owns um, any of the rights to the... Probably it's out of copyright now anyway, the, the, uh, since it was so long ago. But I still think Conrad Veidt was the actor who played the part. 
Yeah. And it, it was just, it's a superb film. Very yeah. sort of tragic. Yeah, absolutely. And so let, let me ask you about that. I think that's really fascinating, just drawing the Joker. And, you yeah. know, I think I'd recognise a Bolland Joker from anywhere because of just how it looks. And, you know, I always yeah. just recognise, this is going to sound weird, I recognise the chin of your Joker because the way it kind of curves down and pulls up. And, you know, as you can tell, I'm, I'm very good now, but I, I can always kind of recognise that in all your pieces. It's just the chin of the Joker always seems to pop and just the way his face... Like, think about the Joker is that he's so weird looking that it's yeah. like, even when you see... The, like, if the Joker came in, you'd recognise him because of not only because his face is painted white, but because of just how weird and, you know, kind of phonetic he is looking, looking wise. And so crafting yeah. the Joker, was that something that you struggled with or were you inspired by some of the previous Jokers? Um, <coughs> well, I, I think I had had a bit of a practice run when I was drawing um, Judge Death, you know, Judge Death. Yeah, that's, yeah. And I, and that's... I don't remember, as, as I covered before, I don't remember what instructions I was given for Judge Death, but that, that the, the grin really, or the teeth thing was a sort of a, a dry run for, for doing the Joker. Although the Joker's a lot more kind of showbiz, isn't he, really? Yeah. Um, um, but, but um, I mean, you know, I go back to the Dick Sprang 1950s and early 1960s Batman comics where uh, the Joker would frequently appear. But it wasn't until Neil Adams came along. There was one particular Neil Adams ish, um, Batman issue, and I can't tell you the number, it has a giant joker holding up a playing card. You might be able to find it. Yes, uh, I, I am aware of that. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know the Neil Adams cover you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully you can find it. And, and in the story, there was... Um, he t um, to me, I was doing the Neil Adams joker. Yeah. But I, I was always a very poor imitator. I always really wanted to be Neil Adams. But I could never manage it. And consequently, it ends up... Uh, looking like something it's look, well it, it looks like i mean there are some pretty extreme versions of the joker now i saw one only the la last week a painted cover i think lee bameko did a particularly graphic looking joker uh, and i think mine is a sort of the, the 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 classic joker but just taken up a notch really yeah just, absolutely I absolutely yeah. agree. I think your joker is brilliant, but I believe this is the cover you're talking about. Let me just hold up my phone. Oh, look at this. Well okay, done. Everyone, can anyone yeah, see that? Yeah, that's that's the one. Yeah. What's the number of that? Does it say? Uh, it's you no, know, this is it's 20 cent number 251, I believe it is. Yeah, well, that's probably the one. Yeah. 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 251 September. But yeah, everyone, that's of course the cover. And but yeah, yeah, no, I think getting to work and so and didn't you get to didn't wasn't it recently collected for what was it, the 25 year anniversary? And didn't you get to recolor some of it? Um no, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, and, oh sorry, are you talking about the killing joke still? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, well, it's a little bit controversial. I mean, I could go all the way back to when the killing joke first came out. I spent two years drawing the killing joke. Um, okay. I was doing other things in the, uh, at the same time, but I'd had it in black and white on my table for two years, and I had a very fairly clear idea of how it should look in colour. Um, and when it... Um, it, when it came out, um, it, it was delivered to the people at Titan Books before it was delivered to me, because they had made an arrangement with DC to bring out an, a, a, a British Titan imprint of it first. So I was talking on the phone to the people at Titan, and I, I was very anxious that the colours would be right. And I said, how do the colours look? And whoever it was I was speaking to said, well, kind of garish. And I thought, Fuck garish. Um, and when I got to see it, it was just so not the way I had oh, really? imagined it. Uh, John Higgins had done it. But I mean, it was good of John to, to jump in so quickly and, and do the job. But his colour sense was just not what I had. I, I'd written some fairly lengthy instructions about the colouring. <laughs> I was talking oh, yeah. about November colours because I'd just been recently been very impressed by by Richmond Lewis's um, colours on Batman Year One, which was very muted, and I really like that. Um, so when uh, this version came out with John's colouring, I it was just not. I, I was rather depressed about it. So, so twenty years later, um, when they were going to bring out the deluxe edition, I said, "Look, can I can I recolour it, please?" And they said, "Sure." And but not only that, but they allowed me to include that short story called "An Innocent Guy," which had originally been in. Batman Black and White, number four. Was it called that? Yes, number four. Yes. Uh, 
Oh, there it is, in fact, on screen, yeah. It was originally, a, yes, with that fantastic Alex Toth cover. Um, one of my proudest moments, really, was being, I think I did a decent job on that little story, which I also wrote. I love it. But, it's such oh, a... Oh, thank you. But, but uh, I mean, the thing about that story, it was as much an opportunity to draw all the things I wanted to draw. I wanted to draw the bat cave. I wanted to draw the penguin. I wanted to draw those th ridiculous three guys with the animal heads. And, and a writer is never gonna uh, provide a, an artist with all the things that the artist would love to draw because they don't know what's in their mind. Ah, but you are so writing and drawing it, so. Yeah, so that was part, I mean, I, it was also a story that was nagging away in my brain. Um, the story but it was also an opportunity to draw those little details but i'm, I'm proud of the fact that it was inside it was behind a, a cover by alex toth which who was an artist i i thought was i think he's was one of the best yeah absolutely really. and Superb so yeah, yeah just we're writing and drawing and i know not a series we're going to get uh, into towards the end but just before we finish up in the killing joke let me ask you about this this middle yeah. middle page here this bottom image, do you see this a lot around the world? Because I think the middle page, the bottom, this image of the Joker with his hands on his head is one of the most <laughs> iconic Joker images of all time. I remember I went into a GameStop and yeah. I was flipping through the posters and I saw this image of the Joker. And I think when so many people think of the Joker, that image is burned into their head. So what's it like seeing that image go around everywhere? Well, it's it's as sort of commonly iconic as the gaze into the fist of dread yeah. image. I mean, I've got mugs with um, the gaze into the fist of dread and posters, but I've also got a Joker mug. Uh, in fact, I think I broke it actually. But with, with, that, <laughs> with that in, I think I've got two, and I think uh, both of them ended up not deliberately. <clears throat> of course, you didn't just snap them. You were angry one day. You were like, "Why isn't there any Walter mugs?" And then you just ripped it apart. We need a, we need a Walter mug, don't we? Yeah, for sure. Right, my mind. No, I, I I see it quite often, but again, I get um, asked to, um, you know, they make limited edition prints of it. It's not one of my favorite favorites because it isn't as well drawn as some of the other things. In my view, I think some really. Yeah, I mean, I can tell the things that I think oh, I've drawn well. You know, and the things I, I could have done better. But, you know, it's, um, you know, it does the trick, doesn't it? Yeah, it, does it always baffles me how, like, artists, I mean, some brilliant artists can look at their work and always see, like, things that they'd like to improve on. And, like, I look at that and it's one of my favourite comic book images of all time. And the fact that you as the artist can look at it and say, no, I could have improved it to some extent is really, really interesting to me. But so, do you remember your process much for working on The Killer Joke? Do you remember kind of what you went through and what you were thinking at the time? <laughs> Do you, is it, does it kind of shock you how just successful this book was, or did you kind of know this is uh, what I'm like? Well, I feel a little bit guilty that people like um, Frank Miller can actually do hundreds of pages, you know, in their special editions, you know. I mean, yeah. um, Dark Knight and Ronin, they have, I don't know how many pages they consist of, but there were quite a number of issues, weren't there? But, whereas this is only 46 pages. Um, and, but... Uh, you know, it's a it's kind of a cheap little gift, really. It's a, it's not an expensive item yeah. to buy, um, and it's a one-off. I do know. I mean, having been to convent, comic conventions, I was in Poland once. I was in Warsaw, and um, somebody there said that American comics didn't really come into that country until comparatively recently, after the, the fall of communism, I guess. And one of the first comics they ever saw was this. So this actually kicked off an interest in well, American style comic books. So, um, and I've forgotten exactly what the question was, but uh, yeah. listen, don't even worry at all. But yeah, what I okay. love about a lot of this is how, like, you know, when we all think of a specific, you know, comic, and like the killing joke just means so much to so much people, and it's still like so many people regard it as one of their favorite comic books of all time. So let me ask you just about the character of Joker, because I think Joker's had a lot of different backstories, but the one that has kind of seemed to stick out of all of them is Killing Joke, and yet it's still not canon because we know at the end of this, he's like, if I'm going to have yeah. a backstory, it's going to be <clears throat> going to be open ended. Anyone, it could be anything, and so. Yeah. Just who is the character of the Joker to you before we move on? Is he just this agent of chaos? Is he just chaos embodied? Or when you look at the Joker, what do you think? Um, the Joker and Batman are two parts of the same brain, in my view. Yeah, um, really? Yeah. There was once a story by Harlan Ellison, uh, drawn by fantastic Alex Nino, called Repent Harlequin, said the TikTok man. 
And I've always thought that there are parallels in Judge Dredd and in The Killing Joke with this, um, this thing. It was, um, the, the Harlequin was, as you'd imagine, a crazy sort of jester-like character. Yeah. And the TikTok man was an agent of order. He was like Judge Dredd, basically. He was, um, it was in a situation, a society where the TikTok people, the TikTok man kept everything running properly. Um, um, the, the Harlequin was the agent of chaos and he just went around causing chaos, as did a lot of the characters in Judge Dredd. And I think there are two aspects of really the same human brain or even of society, really. So I think, you know, the two, the two characters are completely interlinked. Um, they're not separate at all. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting take. And so my last Killing Joe question, and this is something yeah. that I think as you've never been asked this before, so it's going to be very original. You know, did, sure. Joker, did Joker die at the end? You did Batman strangle him? <laughs> no, I, no one's ever asked me that before. No, really? I know. It's so original. I came up with this. I was like, no, it, no, if, <laughs> let me be no I know you've interviewed Grant Morrison. Uh, and if you ask Grant Morrison, he'll say yes. Yeah, that's yeah. how Grant looks. Because for anyone that doesn't know, yeah, he yeah, he's, he started a whole a whole meme, didn't he, about how yeah that, that was a death scene. In fact, I can see it on on the. Uh, I, I assume your viewers can see what I can see, which yeah. is the final page on, on the right. Um, yeah, and for well, anyone that doesn't know that this page has been debated a lot, a lot of fans say because if you see the final page, they're laughing and like they're, Batman's always grabbing on Joker, but a lot of people. Yes. Have said, a lot of people have said, oh, yeah. look, he's choking him and killing him. And then at the end, Grant, uh -huh. Grant the brilliant Grant Day said that when the lights go out, that means Joker's dead. And so it's something that's been a figure of controversy for a long while. And I'm just going to assume you've never answered this before. This is the first time you're ever going to answer it. <laughs> it's the yeah. first time. <laughs> so what do you think? Um, uh, well, uh, some writer I was listening to one day was saying that they just write a book. Um, and then when the book is written, they just put it to one side and it then takes on a life of its own. And the character, and whatever it is that happens in the book is in the mind of whoever is currently reading it. So you can interpret that any way you like. Oh, and I don't think I should really give you any clues as to uh, Alan's and my take on it. But you can look both ways. If I said he's dead, then he's dead. But so I said he's alive. If that's what you want. If that's what you want, I mean, All right. uh, I don't know how come he keeps turning up in movies if he's dead, but uh, there you go. Hear me up, he dies, and then, you know, someone, <laughs> someone comes so, and saves so, him. Is that what you think? You think that's a death scene? I like to look at it as a death scene, but now that I'm talking to the artist, I'm kind of thinking, I really hope, <laughs> I, I, really hope I don't make an arse out of myself. No, I think... Listen, I think he dies, but then this robot comes and brings him back to life. Yeah, I yeah. think I think the robot comes along with a with a life support system. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so that's canon. Walter the robot saved Joker. Okay, we can end this interview now. Everyone, that's basically canon and everything from now on. Absolutely, yeah, for there sure. Go, lovely. What a better way to move on from the killing joke. But we just move on. Move on. An innocent guy. I really love this story. Was this the first time you ever wrote and drew something? Uh, well. Well, technically, no, because I used to write and draw stuff for the undergrounds, didn't I? I used oh, to do yeah. my, my own fan work. Uh, um, I'm trying to think how I've done anything professionally before this. Um, I don't think I did. I've done a lot of stuff for various people that I've lost track of. But I think, uh, uh, but also I have drawn, uh, written and drawn my own characters called The Actress and the Bishop. Yes, I have a few slides prepared for that. Yeah, uh, and they were in the 80s, I think, to begin with. And I had a character called Mr. Mamoulian, who was a sort of stream of consciousness, sort of a scribbly character. Have you ever seen him? Mr. Mamoulian? No, I am actually not Mr. aware. Ah, Mr. Mamoulian, he's called. Um, and it's a sort of... Um, I, I re I, uh, it, In about 1986, around about the time I'd finished Killing Joke, I think, I... I I was thinking I'm spending too much time on this drawing. I'd like, and I was really a, a fan of Burke Brethead's Bloom County newspaper strip with Opus the Penguin and Bill the Cat. And I just love that sort of funny, uh, I've always liked newspaper strips. Oh yeah. Uh, and I wanted to try a, a style which was l less detailed that I could just knock off with a repeatograph. And, and if there were any errors in it, they just had to stay in there. And uh, this character called Mr. Mamoulian, you'll have to look him up. I'm I'll send you a link. I'll send you a link. 
Um, yeah, oh man, he sounds brilliant. I'm going to look him up. Yeah, well, it's completely different. It's uh, he's a sort of a no hope, a little. He looks like a human hedgehog. <laughs> yeah, I'm sold. I need no more information. Okay, I'll send you some links. And I he, love Walter. He, I love fishes, and I love human hedgehogs. This is not something I said in, in this interview, but there you go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I, so I was writing all that stuff, but I couldn't really tell you which order they all come in. Um, I um, I also wrote and drew a few things later on for DC. Uh, I did a thing called the Capas, which was a a story about. Chinese Turkestan in the 1920s, which I did for Strange Adventures. I think it was called, was it Strange Adventures? I think it was called for DC. So yes. there, were a, there were a number of other things that I, I, I wrote a story about the uh, Princess and the Frog, which was a sort of a six or seven or eight page story for Karen Berger. Yeah, but definitely. possibly this was the first one. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's, a, it's one of my favorite short stories, and I think it's such, it's one of my favorite Batman stories of all time because it just says so much, and I, I really do love this story. Oh, everyone thanks. Can go check that out. I don't know if people can still get it. I'm sure there's some collection which includes it, but everyone, if you can, go get it from somewhere. But so after the Killing Joke, did Animal Man come out? Because for anyone that doesn't know, you had a cover run on Animal Man. Was it for what sixty three issues? I think you've done your, you've done your homework, haven't you? I would say <clears throat> I would say it was sixty three issues, sixty three ish. Yes, plus a few plus a few collected edition covers. Yeah. And so you worked uh, on this with my best friend Grant Morrison. Uh, their words, not mine, obviously. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you're you're also my best friend, Brian. Don't worry, I don't want to make you jealous. You can you can be my best friend as well. Uh, but yeah, so how how did like Animal Man come out? Was this straight after DC? W uh, straight after Killing Joke? Sorry, and then hey, um, yes. Well, I mean, Killing Joke and all that was popular, and so I got a lot of work offers, but um, n none of them really particularly appealed. So often I found myself people would say will you do this or that? And I'd say, sorry. And they would say, can you just do the cover? And uh, and this was one of those occasions when I was, you know, you've got to keep in regular work. So the thing that came along was covers. And there were others concurrently, I think, with Animal Man. But, um, and I think at the time, your friend Grant wasn't a, a tried and- Sorry, best friend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was not a tried and tested writer at DC. He was new, wasn't he, at the time? Yeah. And I think probably they gave him one of their less, one of their, not, not the A-lister, B-lister, or possibly a C-lister DC character to, um, to, to, to write. Um, and, and, and Chaz Truog drew him very nicely. And, um, and, but Grant's talent really came out during the run of the first 20 Animal Man's and uh, doing a cover a month was just a very convenient work schedule for me. And also the, the, the stuff was, I'm not really a completely straight laced superhero. Oh artist. no. I mean, having done stuff for the undergrounds and stuff for 2000 AD, but there's a sort of a sardonic humor that I like to creep into the work. Yeah. And uh, Animal Man had that certain kind of tongue in cheekness. Oh, which yeah. I liked, yeah. Absolutely. And I love this this middle image there of him lying kind of at this crossroads. And, yeah. you know, he like you can actually see the hand drawing him. And oh, this is one of my favourite covers of all time. What was your inspiration behind this middle cover? Do you know, um, I can't think that I would have just come up with that. You see, I can't always remember the answers to some of these questions. Like, I don't think I would have just yeah. conjured that up. I, what generally I did was I would go through, I would, be, I would be given the entire script and I'd go through it and I would look for a key image or one or two key images, which um, I thought would think would make a good cover. Um, yeah. And often I'd do three of them and the, and the editor would choose one. But in the case of the one you mentioned, I don't quite remember what my instructions were. And yet you and you also couldn't remember, you know, your social security information when I asked you at the start. Uh, that's right. Yes. I, I, in a moment or two, I'll give you all my passwords, and my social security. Number. Listen, I want to know your mother's maiden name because I want to know about you. I want to know about you, Brian. Of course you do. Yes. And, and also there was that 14 million dollars that is coming my way in a cardboard box, isn't it? I told you I'm an Irish prince. I'm absolutely, right. yes. No, yeah, I look forward to that. I'll send you all the details. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, coming up, Animal Man, you also got to work with Grant on another series 
The Invisibles. Now, I think The Invisibles is some of your best cover work because would you say it's your most experimental period in all of this? Yes, yes, I would. Um, the, edit, the, uh, the, the editor was Shelley Bond, I think, throughout that. And now that was a period when I transitioned from working in ink on board um, to, to using the computer, using Photoshop and the computer, although the three you've got on the screen at the moment. Oh, no, wait a second. No, 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 they're not. Um, the, first, the, the, the one in the middle and the one to the right of the middle, which is what, number four, are actually um, ink on board, I think. Oh, are they? really? Oh, no, wait a second. They're not. No, no, the middle one was actually done as proper as, as actual artwork. The, the ones on to the right and to the left were done in Photoshop. Oh, nice. So there, there was a kind of transitional process during around uh, about number... What, what number is that? Anyway, uh, at some stage. Definitely. A... And so did you think there was some leniency? Because, I mean, Vertigo are known for their experimental stuff, but, like, uh, maybe... When you're doing covers for Wonder Woman or Green Lantern, maybe you wouldn't get away with showing someone who's as fleshy as the guy in Image Tree. So did you feel like you kind of get away with more stuff working on The Invisibles because it was a Vertigo title? Oh, yeah, because it's invisible. I mean, you could get away with different difference. I mean, there were no real superheroes in in uh, at Vertigo, were there? Well, I guess Animal Man ended up in Vertigo, didn't he? And did Swamp Thing ended up at Vertigo? But you're right, you could be a lot more experimental, but... Um, so yeah, do you want me to go along the experimental route or do you want me to go along the route of talking about drawing Wonder Woman and Flash and things like that? Wonder, you can talk anything you want to. I'm not here to control you. <laughs> Don't you worry, Brian. But yeah, let uh, me ask you just about this third image here. That, yeah. did, they, did you get any pushback? Because that dude is terrifying. Did they let you get away with that? Well, of course, yeah. yeah. I didn't get any, uh, I did I mean, the only one I got uh, re remarks about was the cover for one of the trade paperbacks, um, which was a kind of photo collage of a sort of, I called him the Blobby Man. I don't know whether you, you've uh, queued that one up. Oh, I'm afraid not. The no, Blobby no. Man sounds so cool. Oh. Um, and it was made up of a lot of the flesh that I photographed um, and collaged <laughs> together. Look, uh, that sounds, a... that's an artist's dream, just going around taking pictures of flesh. Yeah, it was, there was some real flesh in there. There was, there was some real eyes and, uh, I was being inspired by the work of Francis Bacon, you know, the painter, Francis Bacon. Do you know him? No, I'm afraid I'm not you know? aware. Oh, he's a, he's a real artist, not like, like a comic artist like me. He, he's one of the top British artists, no longer with us, but um, he somehow managed to create sort of nightmarish, vague nightmarish figures. Oh, there, was, he did, like, there was a triptych where he, like, like this, he had three panels of three nightmarish figures somehow sort of contained within boxes, some sort of a box. And I was trying to channel Francis Bacon. I, I think when this is over, I, I'll have to send you a link to the, to, to the one I'm talking about. Um, yeah. yeah, but no, I didn't have any problems with the one on the right at all. Okay. In fact, um, I mean, I don't think he actually removed his mask. He, he was called Quimper. And I don't think he actually removed his mask during the story. So it was a bit of a cheek for me to, to do that. <laughs> yeah. if, if, if Brian, if you ever wanted to design any of my characters, I'm not going to say no. Uh, listen, like, and I have one for you. I call him Robert the Robot. I may have mentioned him. I came up with him. He's completely my own independent character. I didn't get him. Robert, hang on, Robert the Robot? The Robot, yeah. No, yeah. no I didn't get, didn't get him from anywhere else. No. Uh... Uh, I had to change it. Listen. I'm actually stealing Walter from 2080. <laughs> At some point, you're going to have to tell me about you. I don't know anything about you. Listen, you seem very young. I'm an anomaly. I just, I hang out in the night talking about Walter the Boba. I'm not real. Uh, I've been uh, dead for the last 15 years, but every night I come back just to talk about Walter the Boba. <laughs> uh, I, I've had this YouTube channel for a while. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I'm that interesting of a person to talk about. Everyone's here to watch you talk, of course, not me. Okay. My YouTube channel for the last four years, I started when I was 10. I'm 14 now. Oh, and, wow. and I started interviewing writers and la like just creators in general in the last year or so. Yeah. Just live over a year ago. And like when I first started, I had like a dream list of writers. And like now I've gotten to interview so much. I only have like three names left. And it's like, yeah. 
gotten to interview all my heroes. And so you were on that list when I first started because I really loved the killing joke. And I'm so glad I finally have you on. Now, once I track down Dave Gibbons, I've interviewed all yep. my heroes. So I'm just okay. going to track him down. So you can retire then, can you? Yeah, basically. So yeah, I'm just going to put a bounty on Dave Gibbons' head and get someone to kidnap him for me. You know? <laughs> Or here's, I'll get Roger the Robot to do it. Roger the Robot, eh? Yeah, I created him, my character. I don't bring him up much. But yeah, of course, everyone's here to see you talk. I'm sorry for talking about myself. But yeah, let's touch. No, it's okay. Beauty Patrol, which was in our cover. Did you request this? Did you ask them to do so? And this middle image, many people may not realize because it doesn't look like a typical Brian Bolland piece. But did you actually do this? Um, well, there's two questions there. Um, the... Uh, um, because I'd had this sort of connection with with Grant through Animal Man and then th through uh, Invisibles, um, I had taken to reading Doom Patrol, which was a uh, Doom Patrol was a, a, a book that I picked up from 1966 when I was 15, um, drawn by the fantastic Bruno Primiani, um, and so when uh, uh, Grant's reincarnation of the Doom Patrol came along, I had to read it and I absolutely loved it. I, I probably loved it as much as any of his his writing, the, the, just these ridiculously crazy characters. And Simon Bisley was doing fantastic covers on the actual editions. But uh, when it came to the collected editions, I um, all the stories and all the characters were there lay out in front of me so I could have the pick of anything to put on the cover. And so I just pretty much said, look, please let me do the covers. I don't know, I don't know why Simon didn't do them, but um, I did five, I think. And they are some of my favorites. Um, so good. Now, now as for the middle image, um, when they did the collection of the original 60s Doom Patrol run, what I did was I, I swiped um, bits of Bruno Primiani's art and put them together collage fashion and re-ink, re, you know, every line you see there is drawn by me, I but it was way. traced off a collage of, of Bruno Primiani's did original you, did you work make the from collage? the original. I'm sorry? Did you make the collage? Make a clash? No, the collage. The collage. collage. The collage. <laughs> collage. No, did, you, can do, you can do it in Photoshop, you know, you can put images in, put them all on layers in Photoshop. Um, um, the um, the three figures of Robot Man, man and, and um, Negative Man and Rita, the Elastigirl, Girl, were one image. Um, the Beast Boy, who's the monkey with the green face, that was from another sort. But the guy in the background, Mento, was actually in my own drawing. Like that was not a, a swipe. Oh. So I just put the three uh, part swipe, part collage, uh, and part original. Um, on the cover, and I did two of them like that. Uh, they paid me, which was fair enough, but they didn't do. They didn't let me do any more because they realised they could do that themselves for nothing. <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> I, I I couldn't understand that. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, yeah. the Doom Patrol, and I love your work in Doom Patrol. And so this actually, okay. no, this is a question I'll save for a later slide. I, I can already feel it coming on there. Okay. This speaking of jobs, you seeked out. Was Wonder Woman one of these jobs? Did you specifically want to work in this? Yes, process? I yes I did. Uh, yes, I always um, thought Wonder Woman looked great. I thought she was very sexy. Yeah. Um, the, she'd gone through a very unpopular phase through the sixties and seventies. Uh, they, they tried her in sort of mod gear. You know, they tried her in civilian gear, and they tried all kinds of things to make her into a popular character. And uh, uh, George Perez had popularized her. Uh, with a series um, and I don't know whether he was packing up or something but I asked Paul Kupperberg who was one of my editors I've been doing lots of short runs of, th of all kinds of things and I said to Paul Paul I'd love to draw some Wonder Woman covers and he said okay if that's what you want and, um, and the first one was the one you see in the middle it, it, I mean that's one of those covers where you don't have an idea you just yeah. sit down and draw the character in, a, in like a like a a, a, a pin-up basically but um, I think it sort of started off a new sort of popular phase for Wonder Woman after my run was over uh, I mean people like Mike Diodato would be some of the artists on the inside I don't know what other people were in there but eventually um, John Byrne took it over oh, nice. and uh, yeah 
And uh, John Bone was having a phase of, he did Superman uh, on condition that he was allowed to write and draw the whole thing and take over the character. And he was going to do the same thing with Wonder Woman. But apparently I would have been allowed to carry on doing the covers. And I, but, but I thought John Byrne really ought to do, I really ought not to be squatting in, uh, on the cover of a John Byrne comic. Yeah. So I said, no, I'll pack up now. And, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think he said he thought I was chicken, but... Uh, it's such a John <laughs> Byrne thing too. I've heard his name ring up so many times and I, yeah. I, he's a brilliant artist. But, you know, some people have certainly had interactions with him. But yeah, John Byrne, everyone. Uh, yeah, but, he, uh, that's, yeah. That's so on brand for John Byrne. Uh, but yeah, and so I love <laughs> this last image here of her. And it, does, does that kind of have like a little Joker look going on here? This last oh, well, well, there was a, I mean, there was a two episode a Joker a, a story with her. So yeah, that is a Joker. Nice. Um, I mean... My first idea for, you see, you've got, you might have to look this up, but my first idea for the co cover web, Wonder Woman, and she was in a very annoying costume that they, they wanted to change her costume yet again. So um, hence the, the straps and everything. But the, the, I had this idea, the Joker was carrying a bomb under his raincoat. So I thought of a cover where the the Joker is just opening up his raincoat, and you can see her from behind, and she's going like that. <laughs> now, in actual in actual fact, he has a bomb in there, but you yes. don't see it. You but just see the cover. It would have looked you, a bit dodgy. You just see the Joker flashing Wonder Woman, and, her <laughs> going, <gasps> um, and it is. Um, there is a pencil version of it which you can see online. I, I'll send you a link. And it would have made a great cover. I and they wonder rejected why they idea. didn't allow it. Hmm. I know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a brilliant cover. But like, so you, obviously we're talking about, on, like there's a few series, I know Doll H for Hero is one of them, but it's Doll H for Hero, Wonder Woman and Flash, upon which you did like a few covers for the ongoing series and Animal Man as well. So do you prefer getting to work on like a book for continuously, like per issue doing the covers for each issue? Or do you prefer just coming onto a book, doing a cover? And oh, then... um, well, when I was drawing Flash covers, I was drawing Batman covers and Flash covers every month. Um, so I really felt like I was in the bosom of DC Comics because it doesn't get more bosomy than, it doesn't get more central to, to DC than doing Batman. So I was doing Batman Gotham Knights and Flash covers at, at the same time on a monthly basis. Oh, really? And um, now, yes, so I, I do, I, I, I do like uh, having a continue because even though I do, I'm a cover artist, sometimes people would call comics sequential art. Um, and I can see a, a, a series of covers I draw as a sequence, you know, I sort of look at that one and I, and when I'm doing the next one, I'm sort of thinking how to make that one look different from that one. Sure. To, to make that other one different. Um, yeah, and, and those flash covers, incidentally, were drawn in line. And some and somebody else came along and coloured them, except for the last four or five, um, including the, the middle one and the one on the right here, which I, I coloured. I love that image. Yeah. And I love, I love the way you draw Flash running. You can see the little sag behind, but that's something I've seen. Well, that, that was always the way he was drawn by Carmine and Infantino back in the great classic Flash days. And um, yeah, I had a complete set of Flash comics, actually. Oh, yeah? You were a Flash fan growing up? Well, uh, uh, um, the very first Silver Age comic, they say, was, was showcase number four, which was 1957, I think. Um, and I remember, I mean, that was be before I was old enough to collect comics. And I actually remember going to a comic mart and paying over a hundred pounds for that issue, that showcase number four, which was the very first um, appearance of The Flash in 1957. That is actually not bad value. A hundred pounds for the first Flash. Oh, well, I think nowadays it would be a lot more valuable than that. And and, and they tried it out for about six issues in, in uh, showcase. And then eventually he got his own comic, starting with number 105 uh, in about, what was that, about 1960? Yeah. And from that time on, I had the complete set of the first 100 and 120, 150 maybe, which no. were quite hard to come by. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I love that the way you draw Captain Cold. You, you did such a great job, and the guns are frozen. What well, a nice effect! Yeah, I, I like. Yeah, I, I, I like Captain Cold. I, I would have another go at him given the chance. But the one on the right here, that was almost like something out of Mad Magazine. You know that sort of exploding hand thing. Yeah. Oh, we'd, yeah. I mean, we'd never drawn Ash looking that comical. Uh, even his sort of knock knees are kind of done in a kind of comical style. But oh, the, yeah. character's got, the character's got the trick, to, so you know it had to be kind of funny. Yeah, and oh, it's a brilliant cover. And so earlier on in the interview, you asked me who was this shirt actually drawn by, and I only realized yes. it actually says it at the bottom, and I never realized it because I was too busy, you know, talking about how brilliant I am. But the who art is it? Is actually by Robin Smith. Robin, it's Robin. I, 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 I guessed it might have been Robin Smith. You actually yeah. know Robin? Oh, we all knew each other. Yeah, I mean, we're all of the same sort of generation. We're all. Um, you know, all that generation yeah. of 2000 AD people, we used to get together. So it's a Robin, a Robin but, Smith cover. Yeah, anyway, everyone go check out Robin Smith. If I find any links yeah. for on any websites, it will all be down in the description. Uh, but yeah. Hello, Robin. Hello, Robin. Hi, Robin. Watching this. Please <laughs> let me interview you. And so let us move on to, of course, a few more of your covers here. And so you may not know this, but that person in the final slides, Vigilante, is a really big character right now. Are you aware of this? Oh, is he? Uh, in the Peacemaker TV show with uh, John Cena. Oh, he's Peacemaker, is it? With, with John, is he called John Cena? John Cena. Cena. And yeah. he was in Suicide Squad, wasn't he? Yeah. Is that it, a big TV show now? Yeah, Vigilante wasn't in Suicide Squad. He's only just joining uh, John Cena in the Peacemaker TV show. Peacemaker got oh, a TV I, show. I see. And so I see. He, Vigilante plays a part in that. So yeah, back then he wasn't necessarily a huge character, but now he's, and these are just a few covers that I love. And in this first uh, image, Detective Chib, if you watch my channel, you know I have a very weird and pretty creepy love for Detective Chimp. I, I have like two characters I talk about in all my videos. It's Condiment King and Detective Chimp. Condiment King is a Batman villain who shoots mustard and ketchup. And Detective Chimp is a walking <laughs> monkey who solves crime. So are they my two favorite DC characters? Yeah. And I've recognized this image for such a long time. And I never realized you drew this Detective Chimp image. Uh, so is it fair yeah. to say Detective Chimp is the greatest character you've ever worked on? <laughs> is that a fair question? Every character I've drawn is the greatest character. I, I do have a liking for monkeys. I do seem to enjoy, I mean, I drew, drew monkeys on Animal Man. Yeah. I even had a crack at drawing um, Noam Chimpsky from 2000 AD. Yeah, PJ Holden's own. Did you? Uh, Kenneth Neiman yeah. as well. You got to do Chimsky. Chimsky. I, you, you know who Chimsky is named after, do you? I uh, know, but I am aware of the character. got to interview PJ Holden. There right? is a very uh, clever American thinker called Noam Chomsky. And, uh, <laughs> oh, he's a, right. He's, a very, he's a getting on in years now, but he's a, a thinker and philosopher. And uh, I'm not sure what other titles he has, but um, his name is Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chimsky is the character from 2000 AD. Oh, perfect. I <laughs> love the way you... Propeller, with a propeller on his head. But there you go. But anyway, yeah, I do enjoy drawing those chimps. Yeah. yeah. And so let me ask you just, you know, drawing animals, is that even difficult for you? Because you've gotten to do actually quite... You've gotten to draw dinosaurs as well. But is it difficult for you to get to draw animals whenever the chance arises? Um, I use a lot of reference. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I use, uh, I mean, some animals, are, I mean, are horses, I'm absolutely hopeless. I mean, a, a, a lot of the artists I grew up on uh, were doing westerns and they were um, excellent at doing cowboys on horseback. I couldn't possibly draw a horse without swiping it from somewhere. But uh, generally, I can draw chimpanzees and monkeys. And um, I, I did Congorilla covers for a while. Um, yeah, some, really some of them, some of them are harder than others. And so, yeah, yeah this middle image with the atom, uh, first deadly steps, is just so good. I love you can see the mm -hmm. footprint of the soul. So let me ask you, what do you think makes a good cover? As a, just a concept, what do you think is just makes like? Okay, well, I'll tell cover. you. I've got a theory. Um, when I first used to go to, in fact, there's a story included in this. Um, when I I used to go most years to to the DC offices and they what they did they've got all these corridors with all the offices going off the corridors but since everyone's at work the corridors are empty um, but on one of the corridors they have a like a board that contains all of this month's covers now if you look at all of the covers and there may be thirty of them possibly even forty of them um, if you look at them all together. It's interesting the ones that stand out, um, and it's always it's not always what you'd think. 
Um, and the, the story embedded in this is one day I was going to, to, uh, to DC, the offices of DC with my friend Joe Staten, and there was a man standing looking at this board of, of covers. And Joe said to me, let me introduce you to Steve Ditko. No. Um, so that, there was Steve Ditko looking at uh, this sort of large area of covers. And we had a, a brief, not very successful exchange of conversation. So I did get to meet the man. But I've always thought that um, if you take a lot of covers and you shrink them down very small, it's always interesting to see which ones stand out. And they're often quite simple. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of covers that have just big close-ups of faces. And I notice that there are more of those now than there used to be. But I think that if you look, look at a, when I was first buying comics as a kid, um, we used to drive our car to the car park and on the way there would be this spinner. You see this thing here back here, that's a spinner. spinner the, right. the, the comics will be displayed on things like that. Um, and I was able to just see something on that spinner as I drove by in the car. And if you could spot it and pick it out from all the others, it must have been in some way successful. Um, and I remember spotting one day a copy of The Flash on there, uh, and I thought, I've got to get back there because I want that one. <clears throat> so I think a cover needs to be something that um, registers from quite a long way away. It, it doesn't need to be a mass of stuff. Yeah. And I think a lot of 2000 AD covers recently, I've looked at them and I thought, my God, what the hell is going on on there? There's a lot of fantastic, the artist must have spent a hell of a long time drawing that stuff. But if I were looking at it from a distance, I wouldn't be able to make sense of it. So I think it, a simple image often works pretty well. Yeah, There's my, There's my answer. Yeah, that, that's a really brilliant answer. I think you're one of the best comic cover artists of all time, so that's absolutely a brilliant answer there. But so oh. something that I know a lot of people kind of struggle with, and I know I saw something recently on Twitter where someone said, the thing I hate about comic covers is when it depicts something that doesn't actually happen in the story. You know, yes. and I do you necessarily agree with that? What are your thoughts on that statement? No, I agree with that, yeah. Um, a lot of old people like me, we start not a sentence by back in my day, you know, <laughs> and it gets tedious. But um, but back in my day, the covers um, on the comics I was buying was like a, an incident, and it would be like Batman and Robin would be attacked by some like like the kind of, the whole scenario of the story was contained on the cover, and even there might even be a bit of blurb saying Batman and Robin are menaced by the. The, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the zebra of man or something. Um, um, uh, but latterly, I, I would be asked to do a cover and I would say, what, what's going on here? And they would say, just give me an action shot. And, um, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the interior story at all. Just give me an action shot. I, I mean, like the one on the left there, I guess um, I was given very no instructions whatsoever as to what was going on in the story so I just did a that's not an action shot by any stretch of the imagination but I always struggle when I'm told when I'm asked to do an action shot because I want to know what they're doing yeah you know are they hitting each other or are, are they hitting somebody else or are they being or what's going on um absolutely and so in this middle image here is this yeah. tower an actual place in Liverpool am I correct asking? that yeah that is the liver building in Liverpool yeah yeah, so that's a real building. So I imagine that must have been hard for you to draw, you know, because, you know, obviously you want to get that realism aspect down. Uh, it was quite hard, actually, because I didn't actually have a photograph that I could swipe. I, I, I actually had a series. I looked, I found it on, on Google and uh, I had to copy it to the best of my ability. I think possibly the bird was swiped from the photograph but then the rest of the perspective was all all over the place so I had to construct it um yeah, but that was to, but that was to promote the Liverpool branch of Forbidden Planet I seem to remember wasn't it oh yeah absolutely everyone should go check out Forbidden Planet anyway that's actually where I got one of the comics I want to put you now this middle cover now from oh. three years ago or oh, wait do I have it here yeah three years ago or no it wasn't three years ago it's probably a little bit less than that but I had some birthday money and I was looking for Bin Planet website and I saw this cover 
And yeah. it had all my favorite Batman villains. And this one, I was kind of like, you know, I was still a regular comic fan. The name Brian Bolland wasn't so huge to me. And so, not yet anyway. And so I saw this. I was like, oh, I love this cover so much. And it's signed. And so I spent my birthday money on it. And when it came, I, I, had, it up, I had it up in my room. I actually took it down specifically for this interview. It's still in the packet because I've refused to ever read it. Uh, because I'm afraid I'll rip it or something. But this is one of my favorite comics I own. And it's actually signed by you. I got from the Forbidden Planet website. And it's one of my favorite things I own. I remember I spent my birthday money. Oh, and I was so ecstatic when it came. But this is one of my favorite comic covers and one of, one of my favorite comics of all time. So, yeah, you, you played a huge part in that. So just thank you genuinely, uh, Brian. I have to thank you for that. I bet you tell that to all the artists, don't you? Believe it or not, no, I, I don't spend my <laughs> I don't spend my money on half the artists I interview. Once <laughs> well, once they interview them, they're discarded. Um, I mean, nowadays we nowadays not back in my day. Nowadays we seem to be in the era of variant covers, where uh, you know a, a lot because I'm sporadic with my work these days. Um, I, 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 I'm a variant cover guy, um, and um, so so bookshops as, um, order specifically a variant cover on that particular issue so they can exclusively sell it in their shop and but they also want variants of that that, that cover so in that, that one um, was produced in black and white as well as in color and the, there's a version with the logo on and a version without the logo on which is the one you've got by the look of it yes and that was to allow me to put my name on there somewhere um do you know the story behind that particular issue the full story um, um Ooh, back in 1978 when you were minus i don't know what age but minus uh, something i'm not good at math i'm too busy learning about <laughs> comic books yeah <laughs> um they opened the forbidden planet comic store in uh, um denmark street in london in 1978 and i was to do all the first adverts um First, I haven't got it here, unfortunately, it's in the kitchen, but the, uh, the first advert was a, a bunch of people posed in exactly that position. M monstrous creations that I, characters that I created, and it just said people like us shop at Forbidden Planet. Uh, and that cover that you're looking at is, is the same poses, but mm -hmm. with DC characters in, in, and that was a black and white ad, which you can find somewhere. and. So that to commemorate um, Detective Comics a thousand and the fact that it was being sponsored by Forbidden Planet uh, meant that I was able to recreate the original uh, Forbidden Planet ad from and 78. So did you get to choose which villains you got to use? Did you get to, because you got to use- No, I think I'd probably asked who, who would be the villains, but they were pretty much the people I would expect. You and know, the, Pig the... is there, which caught me by surprise. Who? Professor Pig. Professor Pig, yeah. I, I, he, I mean, he, that was a treat for me because uh, he was new to me. I, I, I've seen him, but I didn't, don't think I'd read the story at the time. So it was nice to draw some, because I've drawn all the other characters before, once or twice. I've not drawn Harlequin very often. No. But uh, Prof Professor Pig, it was a bit of a treat to draw him. I've never drawn him before and I've never drawn him since. Yeah, a character co-created by Frank Whiteley and Grant Morrison. And I've gotten to interview both of those people. You should all go check it out. Every Frank Whiteley, yes. And excellent. I, yeah, thank you. And oh, you, Frank is an excellent artist. He's so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, guys, you both are just so brilliant. And I love how you draw Two-Face because like these two, the first image and the second image, they're both different takes on Two-Face, which is really interesting. But Two-Face is my favorite Batman villain of all time. Oh, and, really? Uh, yeah, he's yeah. so fascinating to me as a character. And I love how you yeah. draw him in both these images there. You do such a good job. And well, uh, my, my take on Two-Face is that, you know, if you were to hold your hand up to the bad uh, against the bad side of him the other side of him would look very pleasant would be, he would never look scary yeah uh, and, and and the same with the other side you know uh, if you put your hand over the nice side he would look terrifying so <coughs> excuse me so you always it's always best if you do him full on that way yeah so that's what i think so yeah. who is your favorite batman villain Oh, well, I've, I've always had a liking for Penguin, actually. I've always, um, <laughs> I don't know why. I, I've got a Penguin story in me, actually. After the killing joke, uh, I did think about writing my own story. Listen, they're doing uh, Batman uh, black and white, I know. And if you, uh, if you went to a DC editor just with the name Brian Bolland, they're going to let you do yeah. it. Yeah. 
Actually, I, I, I can't show it to you, but I, on the wall just up there, um, there is a penguin cover that I drew for DC, uh, and I've always kept it quiet. It's, I've not published it anywhere in case DC ever wanted to pay, pay me for it and use it. And I was talking to DC recently about whether they would like it as a cover, but they said, no, the penguin now looks different. He's, it's not, he doesn't look like the, the one I drew on that cover, that to 1000. He's got a sort of, he, he's less of a pudgy old man and more of a monster now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's comic for you. That's comic for you, everyone. And so, <laughs> well, and so let, me, let me ask you just, be, just before we move on, what's your take on Batman? And has it changed your back take on Batman and Joker since The Killing Joke? But who is Batman to you? Because, you know, in all these different images, he looks like in one of them, he's that bluish. And like, do you look at him as kind of fear embodied? Because if Joker is chaos embodied, then maybe Batman is fear embodied. But who is Batman to you before we move on? Um... I've never been very convinced by the whole Batman backstory at all. I've not, never been terribly interested in it. Oh, really? I just see him as one of us, a number of characters like the Shadow, you know, the Shadow. Yes, yeah, I do and know the Shadow. What, what evil lurks in the hearts of men only the Shadow knows. I think he's just one of a series of a sort of pulp characters who are shadowy figures. And I think in some ways, the less you know about him, the better, you know, you he's much better when you just see his shadow like judge dread in some ways i think yes i mean he's a sight is the word cipher a character that you don't really know yeah um, an anomaly you could say you know yeah, so i i just said about drawing him i don't really think too much when i did i haven't done him for a while but when i do it, it I, i'm not really thinking too hard about the wayne foundation and all that that money they seem to have and the cave and all the rest of it and but, so, so this is something I only realised there. Is that fish Joker holding uh, Judge Fish mutated? Is that is that dark Judge Fish? <laughs> is it? <gasps> that's a million dollar story idea. Um, no, that's um, Marshall Rogers drew uh, uh, and um, Denny O'Neill. I think was it Denny O'Neill who wrote a terrific series of stories where um, the Joker poisoned Gotham Harbour. Yeah, so all well, the, yeah. So all I, the fish, all the fish came out with grins. I will admit, Danny O'Neill is probably better at coming up with story ideas than me, but I've, I'm going to begrudgingly admit that just because Danny's a legend. But yeah, uh, before we wrap up soon, I know I have a few more things I want to touch on. I'm so sorry for taking up so much of your time. Uh, yeah, but sorry. another thing is, you got to do some cover work just outside of DC and Marvel. I, have you gotten to do much work in, in terms of covers and just interiors outside of DC and Marvel? Especially with covers? Oh, well, I, I do. Uh, occasionally, I sort of... Uh, I mean, I've, I've got a long-time relationship with DC. See, I know that they pay me, you know, and I know some of the people who work there, although it keeps changing. Um, but uh, I, yes, I do. A, I did a, a cover for, on Barbarella recently, which was Dynamite Publishing. And I've, I, 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 um, I, I've done a couple of covers for The Steel Claw. The Steel Claw was a, uh, was a character in a, a 60s comic that I had when I was a kid called Valiant. And uh, they're collecting all those stories, black and white stories in rather nice book editions and I've done two covers so far so that's for Fleet that's for Rebellion isn't it so uh, so I, did, I still do the occasional bit of work for 2000 AD and Rebellion and you know people uh, I did a, a cover on a collection of a newspaper strip called Carol Day uh, which again was from the 60s um, and I'm not even sure the name of those publishers so yeah I do sort of um, occasionally uh, succumb to work work for other people yeah and so we see some i think these are all actually vertigo uh, stuff you've gotten to work on here which is some brilliant these the yeah, a tango of course was a british character that was um licensed briefly by dc yeah oh, it's brilliant. lovely a lovely i love tango and i really enjoy drawing her covers i did probably eight. Oh, really yeah, you did. yeah yeah I, I think so yeah, yeah. and so yeah. This is one of another thing I do outside of uh, DC and Marvel. This image, I love it so much. Is this this is a collection of the Vertigo characters? Am I correct in saying so? Uh, yeah, that is. Yeah, that was a Vertigo um, anthology of some sort. I did that for was that Karen Berger? Uh, it looks as if it's been sort of stretched sideways by um, by that. Yeah. The whole idea of that was that if you look, you'll see that if you turn it, if you make a loop of it, uh, the the figure on the right will continue. On the left. Oh yeah. yeah oh, I'm only after just realizing that now. Hey, everyone, if you look at the yeah. end, you can see it internally. How accurately? How accurate it is? I don't know, but um, and that was my attempt anyway. 
And the, then the middle character, is that the Sandman? Did you know much of these characters as of time of working on them? Well, I'd, I'd read um, a bit of John Constantine, and of course the characters on the right were from the uh, Invisibles. I really can't remember where the emu, or no, I suppose an ostrich came from. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you just, I, I, it's your artistic I, interpretation, you just threw them in there, it's nothing to do with No, I, I wouldn't have done <laughs> No, he would have come from somewhere, I can't remember where. Yeah, absolutely. And so your Constantine, actually, I don't have any slides prepared for that, but I did an interview with Jamie Delano and there's one Constantine cover, which I really loved. And so you didn't get to do much work in Constantine, did you? No, no, no. Um, oh, that's a shame. You, you I'd, Well, you it. know, I, I, I because I know the editors and I know some of these people, they, they've got a few pages to fill and they say, can you do a pinup? So I did a pinup of Sandman, which I rather liked for... I think it was Shelley Bond, and uh, I did a, oh God, there was even another character whose name I can't remember, but the, you know, I do the occasional one-off just to fill in what they call a pin-up page, and, um, and I did a Hellblazer John Constantine cover for a collected edition once. The, the, the local church where I live here, in 1914, um, it was burnt down. So oh. there were lots of photographs of a church in ruins, and uh, I used the ruins of my local, when I say my local church, it's the church in the village here, um, in the, as the backdrop to a, a John Constantine cover one time. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I know the exact cover you're talking about, it's a really okay. good cover. I'll see if I can find it here while we're chatting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the next thing I'd love to touch on is Marvel. You haven't gotten to do much work for Marvel, and so is that something, you know, you've ever regretted, or are you happy with the work you've done? Because growing up, you weren't never much of a Marvel guy, were you? I, I, I'm afraid I was not. No, I started collecting comics in 1960, 61. Uh, that was a couple of years before Marvel came along, and I, I'd already got... A sort of set a, a collection what, what's, what have you got there oh it's very oh, that's the, let me just that's the hellblazer cover yeah very, yeah, let me very good one. yeah you can yeah. see great cover yeah. yeah that's the one yeah it, it looks a bit different from the way i drew it i can't see the church very well in the background um, uh, no yeah. i was never i was never a, 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 a there were certain artists at dc that i love gil kane i love uh, carmine infantino murphy anderson um um a few people like that, and of course Alex Toth and Bruno Primo. Um, so I, and I, I, at some stage in an interview, I have to say this, and it shocks people. They usually, that, it's usually when they switch off. But I was never a Jack Kirby fan. No. I know he's, I know he's a massively, massively, he's the king and everything, and he's massively popular, and Marvel um, customers love his work and there's a whole backstory between him and Stan Lee but uh, I never got if into If you weren't it. a Walter the Wobot fan I would have blocked you I'm sorry to say I that. know you'd have blocked me you'd have blocked me <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll take no prisoners on this matter I'm afraid but it, it's okay <laughs> I mean my take on um, comics American comics is you only need so many superheroes and we had Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman uh, um, blah 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 and I found a lot of the, the Marvel characters looked like the Marvel equivalent of those sort of characters with a different name, like Green Arrow is Hawkeye. Um, um, and since I was more oriented towards the look and the, 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 the visual appearance of these characters, I didn't quite see the point of getting to know a whole load of, but there were exceptions. I thought uh, yeah. Conan was unique. So I, I, I got very into Conan uh, and I loved how the duck, um, how, uh, Steve Gerber's, um, was he the, writer of how the duck uh, i i loved how the duck such a good character i love how you draw howard the duck you make him look yeah like, that's how i think of howard the duck i would have had another crack at howard the duck if i'd given if i'd been given but i there were a, two or three incidences where i got my artwork in late at marvel and they got some other artist to finish my cover for me and i'd had already had a bit of a bad experience with marvel uk so I felt it was probably best to just stick with DC, partly because I know their characters so well. Yeah, absolutely. And I love, I, I love the way you draw Howard Duck. But we're, we're approaching my last couple of slides and then, of course, Actress and the Bishop. But Superman, oh. uh, let me t let's touch on Superman, one of the most iconic comic book characters of all time. Have you got well, to draw I'm Superman? The first, I'm the first, really. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the first of the superheroes, really, wasn't he? Yeah, and so did you get to, do, have you drawn much Superman? 
Um, only covers. Oh yeah, and is I don't it think I, uh, I did a one-page story which was in uh, in a something or other which had which it was an interior. It was a Mister Mixius Pitlick, you know, the little magic imp. Yeah. Oh, is but that how you him, pronounce it? That's, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I Who knows? Um, uh, and it was a, a little story, a little one-page story that had him in, uh, and apart from that, just a few covers here and there. A and co collected editions, I do a lot of trade paperback collected editions of Superman and Lois Lane, not Lois Lane, um, Jimmy Olsen, who was, you know, the news newsboy. Um, so stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's all. I actually, it's, I know how to pronounce his name. It's Mr. Mix with Walter the Robot and uh, Mix a Pixel, I believe. <laughs> that's something, I, I don't know. That's, that's, that's it, yes. It's, that's how you pronounce it. It's French, so it might have got lost in translation. But I love this last Justice Society. I mean, I, you have done quite a few team book covers. Is it different? Is it harder getting to work on a team, doing a cover for a team book as opposed to like... A oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, I always find that my if I'm drawing an image, the main figure I managed to do okay, and then the secondary character and then the third character and the fourth fifth i always get more and more bored <laughs> <laughs> as, as the population increases uh, i did two of those justice society covers that was the second one and um the first one was better that one there isn't very good in my view i think it's a great image there yeah and I, my friend uh, in the comic business joe Staten, did comment that I managed to get the tin hat I, I'd done the tin hat properly because it would sort of it would never stay on your head for one thing if you were if you were traveling very fast that hat wouldn't stay on your head would it yeah I, I absolutely do not think I think it's a, I think it's a fashion choice obviously you know I think so. it's, he's making a <laughs> statement by wearing that he's showing you know I, I assume it's a Gucci metal hat I may be wrong I don't know I'm sure that's probably sad. yes yeah, probably absolutely and so my last cover slide before we go into actress and the bishop is these are these are your most recent covers, am I currently saying? So, or just in terms of stuff you've gotten to do recently for these? Yes, yes, they are. Yeah, I yeah. love how you draw Swamp Thing. You make him look so cool. Well, I've drawn Swamp Thing. I did a run of Swamp Thing covers a while back. One of them had a Nazi theme to it, which I think is a fairly striking cover. Actually, it's got a swastika on the cover in the shape. Well, it's an American flag, but in the shape of a swastika. You'll have to look that one up. Oh. Um, but um, uh, and I did a few others which were back in the end of my working in ink phase of my career. Um, but now that I'm retired, I don't have to work constantly. Uh, but it does mean that um, I can choose what I fancy doing. And I just noticed that Mike Perkins is doing some lovely work on, on Swamp Thing at the moment. And um, I realised that people are doing him in a way which is better than the way I did him previously. I mean, I only did a few covers because yeah. um, Steve Bissett did, um, was responsible for the, the great resurgence of uh, Swamp Thing with Alan Moore, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, but and he's a great character to draw because you can, you can improvise really, you know, you can draw branches and roots all over the place without having to, uh, 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 there's another one which you can't see yet because it's not uh, out yet. I've done a third Swamp Thing cover and it, nice. uh, he's, uh, he's Swamp Thing, but he's also part machine. Now machines are That's a lot nice. harder to draw than, than foliage and roots and fungus and stuff because they, they come in geometrical forms and geometrical forms take a lot more time to draw than like sort of twigs and roots. Um, yeah, I was always I was always really crap at drawing spaceships, and people have said that about me. That when I'm required to draw science fiction, I'm really shit at drawing spaceships. Oh, uh, really? Have you have you done much sci-fi stuff? Uh, well, I, I mean, Camelot three thousand is technically science. Oh fiction. yeah, is there is there spaceships in Camelot? Well, uh, the, the the spaceships I swipe from vertebrae of you know you know when I found that dead sheep on the on that on the hillside. Oh yeah, the one that you cut <laughs> open and took its skull. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was also a spine there as well, and, and I, I thought, well, I'll use fragments of spine as, as spaceships, and if you look, you'll find the spaceships in Camelot. That's such a huge actually, thing to do, you just cut open are, it. They're like, actually I'll... sheep vertebrae, yeah. So, <laughs> I, I, I mean, in order to draw a spaceship, uh, you've got to be able to draw in perspective, you've got to be able to draw ellipses and 
circles and a lot of very technical shapes. Um, and some people are very good at it. And uh, it's, it's always been very time consuming, but drawing Swamp Thing is great because you can just go off in any direction you want. Yeah, and you make them look like so scared. Like I showed it to my sister and I don't think she was a fan because it is a terrifying image and I'm going to stay up thinking about it. But yeah, absolutely. And I really love this image here. But let me ask you, this middle image here, did you draw all the individual finds that led into the actual Swamp Thing word? Yes. You you actually lettered it. You kind of lettered that title. Yes, yes. Well, I, I mean, at the, you know, I just said, can I do another cover? And they said, yeah, sure, do another cover. And I said, is there a theme of any sort? And... Uh, they sort of gave me some vague idea of what the theme was, but I had this idea even after I'd finished the first one on the left, um, the first one, first one for me, I just had this image in my mind of the fingers um, just branching, because I spent, because we've got a garden outside here and I spent a lot of my time looking at fungus and looking at trees and things like that. And That's I just had this, yeah, I just had this idea of uh, his fingers you see, that is the original Swamp Thing logo from the original 1971 series, if it was, you know, by Bernie Wrightson and Len Wein, um, on, and not the current logo, but I, I, I'm not all that familiar with the current logo, so I just uh, drew the, the, the branches taking on the form of the original Swamp Thing logo, so I drew all that. It took forever. Oh, I'm, spending yeah. I'm spending absolutely ages on my work at the moment, uh, you know. It's ridiculous. I've never, I've never been able to make a living doing this kind of thing. No, I know, but I think that the fact you put so much care and intricate detail into it, like I remember seeing that all over Twitter, and people were like, "Oh, he's done it again. Bolin is the master." At it. And I said, yeah, <laughs> "Not as good as uh, Walter the Wallbot work, but not." No, that. I know. Well, I'm working my way up to that. <laughs> Dude, you actually still have that Walter the Wallbot image? I realized I wasn't, I wasn't filming when we shared it. Everyone, look at this. It's just going to go. Well, I've got, I mean, I've got all this stuff here. You know, that's, that's yeah, it's beautiful. My eyes are almost melting. It's like Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's just, it's so glorious. <laughs> it's one of my um, favorite. Artists. Is that an original one for the Hobo? You're going to have to buy the new Apex Edition book of my work coming from Rebellion. Uh, oh, they're doing an Apex Edition? They're doing an Apex Edition of, of my Judge Dread work, including all this stuff. Um, and I think it's, they're actually publishing it artwork sized, aren't they? Um, but it's it's pretty expensive, and I, they're doing one of for Mick McMahon, and I think they probably I think they're going to do a couple of volumes of Dave Gibbons as well. So uh, oh, you'll have name. to save your pen. You'll have to save your pennies, won't you? Oh, of course, it's the second money spent. So, uh, mom and dad, if you're watching this, I've been really good. Please just get me this. Just one thing, you know. Brian cuts open dead sheep. He's a good role model. Just buy it for me. Come on. <laughs> so yeah, I think I've made a good point there. But is that an original Walter piece, or is that a re like just an art print you just showed us there? No, this is all artwork. This oh, that's original. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think it's in really good shape for being an original piece. Well, I mean, I mean, I don't drag it through the mud, you know. I mean, it, it is uh, <laughs> friend of Dwed. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just uh, you see, I can't see what's on the screen now because I'm actually behind this thing. So it's know. okay. I'm, I'll make the sacrifice if it means we get to see Walter the Wobba. Now that guy there, you see, is uh, the from the Don Martin cartoon in Mad. You see that I told you about. Oh, brilliant! Remember, I told you I swiped oh, you yeah. directly from a, uh, But I think so. There you go. But they let me do it. So cool. And so, yeah, of course. And so punchline this cover here, but everyone go pick up that apex. It will we'll promote that at the end. Punchline was this character with the research because she's rather new to the DC lore. Did you have to do research on punchline? I didn't get that question. Do I have to do research on punch? Oh, punchline. Yeah. This character. Here. Ah, oh, sorry. I'd forgotten what her name. I'd forgotten her name. Now, the story here was that um, I originally drew the Joker in that pose with um, Harley Quinn in the bottom left hand corner. And I, I provided the artwork complete and in colour with Harley Quinn there. And there is a, a version of that cover with not in print, um, with Harley Quinn. But they said, no, can you change her to this character called Punchline? And I said, who the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they sent me some reference and I then had to go back, because when you're working in Photoshop, you keep a copy of various stages of the work. So I had to go all the way back to the line version of the drawing, paint out Harley, uh, Harley Quinn, um, paint in this new face of this character 
and then recolor the whole thing yet again. And, uh, and now, so I think, did you ask me, did they provide me with reference? Yes, yeah. they would have, otherwise I would never have heard of that. Oh, yeah, amazing. And so we've gone through just about all your major covers. Now for the main event before you wrap up. The yeah, okay. And the bishop. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I made this image. I put together it. And you can see only looking at it now that there's kind of a line going across the black. It's because I was too lazy to look up the color black. I zoomed in on the black in one of your drawings. And I said, that's yeah. good enough. I'll leave it there. No one will know. So now looking now, I can see there's a line. But I think it adds texture. And I also did make the font really fancy just because I'm brilliant. But yeah, The Actress and the Bishop, this is your own series that you're writing and drawing. No, you know you have to be 18 to be with this stuff, don't you? Yes, I have not read it. But yeah, this is no, of course. series. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Gary Leach and Dave Elliott... Was it? Well, the, the guy, they published in the eighties a, a an anthology comic called A One, and it was all the current um, big names in the British comic scene were invited to do anything they wanted, and uh, so I got three pages, and um, I had previously drawn these two characters on a French in a French portfolio of art prints. I just had this grotty old bishop. And this beautiful raven head beauty in yeah. close up and uh, i um and so when they asked me to do a three page story about anything i had these two characters already in, in existence and i thought there you go and i thought i ought to know a little bit more about them yeah and so i decided i would write their story in the form of a rhyme oh uh, yeah, a bit I like rhyme. Yeah. So all the all the text I know you haven't read it yet because you're not allowed to read it until you're 18. But uh, <laughs> of course, of course. it's it's perfectly innocent, really. And um, and so now there are two three page stories. There is one 20 page story, uh, all of which were collected in a thing called Bolland Strips, which uh, uh, is available from Knockabout Books. Yeah. Uh, it was also collected in this edition from. Uh, what, were they, what was the publishing company there? Desperado. Um, Desperado, my friend Joe Pruitt. Uh, and I also recently wrote um, and drew a 14-page story, new story, which was not um, taken up in print by anybody, and you can view it uh, on Facebook. And oh, yeah. I think it's on Instagram. Yeah, called and The so, Actress and the Bishop. The it, Actress and the Bishop. having a bit of fun and doing kind of whatever you'd enjoy to do. Well, um, I, I, it's as much fun to do this. It's been, if, if anything, it's more fun to do this than anything else because they are my characters. Yeah. And I can, I can have them do whatever I want. And, uh, the, the, and all of this smut that you might imagine might be going on in the story is purely in your, own, in your imagination. They're, not, they're, they're both completely innocent. Of course, um, of course. They just go and do the washing up and they, or they go to the seaside or they... Uh, they go on a boat outing, and that's that's all that happens. Yeah, good old fashioned Brian Bond and story time. So, is anywhere people can go pick up the issues or from Desperado? Um, uh, um, well, there is the book. Um, I've got one up here. Um, well, there it is. Oh, I just happen to have uh, found a the Serbian edition of the book there. So that's, of course, that's just the Serbian edition, <laughs> because why not? It, it, there is the English edition, which I don't happen to have, uh, but but they've even respelled my name in Serbian there. Oh um, wow! But uh, the, the book is called Bolland Strips, and uh, but the new story, um, I haven't actually managed to uh, get it into print yet. It's uh, it's called the. The, act the actress and the bishop go to the seaside. I, I don't mind sending you some um, pages of it if you'd like to add it here somewhere. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, yeah. that's brilliant. Everyone go pick up the actress and the bishop. But now, my, uh, my just my last final couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Have you noticed improvement as an artist? Do you look back to your earlier work and say, I could have done this, I should have done that, or I could have done this? <coughs> and do you find you're still constantly improving? Um, I'm getting slower. Um, yeah, but you're getting more intricate in that. Yeah, I'm getting more intricate. I mean, um, I, I think I covered it earlier that if I look at my very oldest work, I see a youthful enthusiasm. I see an, a lack of inhibition. I was not frightened <coughs> to um, just get something done. And, and um, 
I was not frightened of failing. Um, so there's a kind of a, a joie de vivre kind of thing going on in my early work, which I like the look of. Now, and I've got an ob a obsessive sort of character and I, I tend to, now that I've, I, I have the luxury of having as much time as I want to do anything, I put a lot of work, a lot of detail into stuff. Uh, but I think also now, <coughs> because I'm able to do some things just for my own pleasure, even when it's not going to be published anywhere, I, 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 I'm very satisfied with uh, some of my choices. So uh, yeah. it's a swings and roundabouts kind of thing. Absolutely. My second last question. What's your yep. dream comic book? Who's that one character you never got to work on our team or just something in general that you've never got the chance to you would have loved to work on or that you maybe soon want to work on? Well, I, mean, I, I often think that, <coughs> that even if it's just once, I, I seem to have drawn just about everybody I can think of. I can hardly think of a character that I haven't at least once. Have you drawn. ever done Walter from 2000 AD? No, never. No, never. <laughs> Um, oh, it was I, you! No, I knew that. Maybe, maybe my dream job would be to draw Walter the Robot one, once. <laughs> once. Listen, I have the perfect script for you, Bubba. We're going to pitch this to DC. We're going to go big, all right? Go big or go home. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so is there actually a dream character you'd like to work on, or have you just gotten to do them all? Um, <clears throat> um, if I can think of a character that I really feel like... I mean, well, actually, a bit of me would rather like to draw... Uh, Rupert the Bear. I drew Rupert the Bear. He was a character, he goes all the way back to 1920. Uh, but we recently had a book called um, Masters of British Comic Art written by David Roach. Um, and um, I did the cover and I managed to get Rupert the Bear on there. And um, his stuff was drawn by Mary Tortell and uh, Alfred Bestel. And I'd love to draw in that sort of style. So Rupert the Bear. It's a brilliant answer. I definitely didn't expect that. Uh, my last and final question, if anyone was looking to get into comic books as an artist, what advice would you have for them? Don't. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you'd uh, make a living at it now. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a tough one, really. I, I mean, I, a lot of new people seem to be cropping up in... Well, certainly 2000 AD, because I don't get to see many comics, but uh, there are new names, new face well, not faces, but new names seem to be cropping up as, with art credits frequently. Uh, so I guess there is a, there are openings for new people and new artists. But um, I'm so removed from the way I got into the business. It's so many, so many years ago that I wouldn't know what it's like to do so today. So I, it, it would be hard for me to give any advice. Absolutely. And so you just but go for it. Go for it anyway. Just go for it. Now yeah, that's brilliant for everyone watching it. And so this brings me to an interesting point. A while ago, I got to interview Ario Andio, who is the current artist of a big Star Wars series. I believe the first copy so far, like so really well. It's a really huge series. But Ario Andito, and he said he went to a Comic Con and he met Brian Bolland himself and he gave his portfolio. He did a portfolio review with you. And you said, you know, I don't know how it is now, but I reckon, you know, one day you could work in DC. And he said, he was like, that's the moment that it all changed from when he got to meet Brian Bolland. Brian Bolland gave him that advice. And it was such a great story to hear him say that. But yeah, Ariel, if you're watching this, I'm joined by Brian. But he oh. said that, that kind of that moment really inspired him and really encouraged him because he was kind of struggling with that in his career. And now he's working for Star Wars. So. Wow. Yeah. So Ariel, great job. If you're watching this, good job, man. Um. But yeah, so, so what I said earlier, don't kindly disregard everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I look. I don't listen to anything you say. Take it up. You'll end up working in on Star Wars or something. Yeah, I just disregard whatever Brian says this whole entire time, unless he brings up Walter. Because then I'm like, yeah, great character. But no, absolutely. Uh, Brian, before we wrap up, are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anything like that? Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram. And um, that's all at the moment. I, I don't do Twitter, but um, just, so I'm on those two. So you're just Brian Balland on both? Yes, I'm just me. I don't have any pseudonym. Um, and uh, I don't currently have a, a, a website. I had a website, but it's been defunct for quite a few years. I, I find it's quite okay to just communicate with. I have to admit that there is a Brian Bolland Appreciation Society 
page on Facebook. So a- anybody can join that. And I'm always on there. So you can talk to me on that if you want. Yeah, that reminded me when I got this comic about like two years ago, I actually made a video in my recent comic haul and I put it up on the Brian Bonin appreciation page. I was like, here in this video, I talk about my Brian Bonin comic. So I will send you that. So just to show you, this is a true story that two years ago and I'm like, I got this comic from Brian Bolland, everyone. He's a really good <laughs> artist. So I will show you that. But yeah, no, absolutely. Everyone okay. go check out the Brian Bolland Appreciation page. I'm a proud member. Uh, go check out any new comics or books or art books anyone can pick up. Well, there is this new Apex edition. Um, I don't know what the name of it is, but it's, it's all my Judge Dredd work. Uh, and I think it's being published artworks size big like that. <clears throat> so that's coming out in the next month or two, i.e. February or March of 2022, which is when we're, well, we're not actually speaking in February or March of 22. Or are we? I'm I'm a ghost. I'm not, this isn't real. I'm just Walter de Woba. It's the same (laughs) as the present past. I'm your past coming back. But yeah. And there are, and there are quite a few covers still in the offing that haven't actually uh, appeared yet. Nice. So that's the Apex edition and the other stuff, just that? Yes, that's all so far. The actress and the Bishop from Desperado, which everyone goes, and you can also go check that out. But go check out Brian's work. Go pick up his work. Go follow him on social media. Brian, I'll talk to you a little bit off air. But everyone, thank you all so much for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you have the means, as always, please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Trans Society. And there'll be a link for that in the description. If you do have the means, it'd be much appreciated. But if not, do not. No worries at all. But and yeah, you can follow me over on Twitter at Sambo Gizmo One if you'd like. It'll be a stay safe, everyone, and long live Walter the Wolva. I mean, go check out Brian's work. It'll be a stay safe, everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.